Международная научно-практическая конференция «Цифровая трансформация промышленности. Тенденция управления...» Uh, this year, this is uh, a, a very contemporary format of the conference and it uh, made it possible to uh, involve a lot of interesting participants uh, from uh, Russia and from uh, European countries and uh, including the America. And uh, before we uh, move to uh, the greeting, our conference is happening in two languages, Russian and English, and there is simultaneous interpreting. The instruction in, in English and in Russian is in uh, the chat, uh, so I'm going to give you details here. I'll just uh, start uh, uh, the conference and uh, the uh, aim of our conference is to assess the trends and, pro and the future of digital transformation of industry and industrial markets to establish the understanding of mechanism of the implementation of uh, digitization processes, uh, uh, successful uh, strategies of digital transformation of uh, industry and industrial enterprises. And of course, we all understand that uh, the digital transformation is without uh, overestimation is the principal uh, direction for the development of uh, the industry contemporary industrial production he uses digital technologies in all its aspects um, of work and digital transformation makes it possible to resolve at a new level the um, uh, ever more complex uh, goals uh, set before industrial enterprises. And uh, these trends, uh, the process of digital transformation is uh, still at the early stage, even in the develop uh, developed countries. And uh, as uh, the study, McKenzie Global Institute uh, study showed the uh, degree of adaptation of digital technologies to, um, in terms of uh, implement realization of business potential is uh, only about 20% from a possible uh, as uh, of uh, 2012. And uh, in the industry, these uh, uh, indicators are lower than in the economy of, on the whole. And in Russia, in, uh, as, a, as a part of the uh, federal project, uh, digital uh, um, industry, the digital platforms are being rolled out. Uh, this approach is uh, um, uh, spreading in the world industry is one of the key mechanisms of uh, digital uh, transformation of the industry. And uh, today, dear colleagues, uh, within our program, as part of our program, we have uh, first is a plenary meeting, which is uh, made up of two parts and uh, a plenary section uh, which is uh, going to be uh, about uh, digital platforms on a mechanism of transformation of industry and uh, this uh, taking into account that uh, uh, the time is quite early european uh, the european keynote uh, speakers they're going to join us a little bit later so there is a little bit of a change in the program uh, some keynotes is uh, will be happening in uh, record it will be in the youtube so you can actually watch it there in more detail and of course uh, now wishing you success uh, uh, the today very um, complicated day the entire day we're going to have the in plenary meeting and then the section meetings we're going to start um, our keynotes and now the first i give the stage to sergey uh, sergey kortov uh, uh, Doctor of uh, Science and Economics, first uh, Vice Rector of the Euro Federal University, uh, Yeltsin University. And Sergey, please, uh, the stage is yours. And uh, the uh, lecture is the trends of digital modeling and digital twins, a uh, case of uh, the Euro Federal University. So uh, the stage is yours. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, hello, dear colleagues. And uh, now uh, I'm going to turn on. Uh, the, I'm going to share the screen. Uh, can you see me? Yes, I can see you. But you could probably press F5 
and uh, everything is uh, just excellent. So, dear colleagues, uh, I am ever so grateful uh, for this uh, opportunity given to me. And, uh, uh, the uh, keynote is uh, actually uh, called shorter than the program uh, states. Uh, this is just a view on the digitization uh, trends. And uh, first of all, uh, there are two interesting graphs here that uh, show the trends uh, uh, of uh, the two key in the global economy. Two indicators: this is uh, the uh, GDP per capita uh, and the uh, number of dwellers. Uh, of, uh, uh, the population growth. And you can see here how these indicators uh, uh, behave. The, uh, this is our uh, millennium uh, that is listed uh, here. And here on the graph, uh, there is uh, this uh, uh, acceleration in uh, uh, 150 years, the most recent 150 years. And, uh, uh, it is called singularity, the mathematicians uh, uh, call it, and uh, uh, this vegetation is given to the economic growth as an issue, because uh, when the growth is this, and uh, when there is economic, economic growth is like that, this is a condition for the survival of humanity. Currently, currently from um, our, in our view, there is an intensive uh, search for organizational, technological, economic, and other and political mechanisms uh, to provide for the economic growth. And uh, one of the mechanisms of uh, this is digitization. The next slide you can uh, show the compilation of digital technologies and, and the life uh, cycle curves of digital technologies, 20 digital technologies, uh, which... Uh, uh, most popular and uh, can be heard about a lot recently. And uh, I can only point out that the implementation of these technologies uh, is uh, this is a similar type of a singularity that we saw in the previous uh, curve. So there is this explosive growth of various technological solutions which are implemented very quickly in practice. And our colleagues are. Uh, um, the scientists, they trend, uh, they call uh, the industrial revolution. Uh, that is the term uh, they use. Uh, we know the theory on uh, technological uh, um, customs here. And uh, uh, in most recent years, is more popular. Uh, this is the concept of industrial revolution. And uh, this concept uh, was, uh, it is not very young. It's about 40 years ago. You can see on this uh, slide, you can see uh, some uh, scientists that uh, uh, contributed into the uh, formalization. Uh, this is Elvin Toffler. Uh, we used uh, the uh, third Jeremy wave, uh, Jeremy uh, Rifkin, uh, and the Klaus most recent Schwab, one, this is Klaus Schwab, uh, who formulated this is the concept of the fourth industrial revolution, which is now uh, most popular, and which uh, has turned uh, into different industrial uh, uses, uh, uh, sectors of industry, and um, the format, it is the Industry 4.0 in different countries. Uh, it is uh, an accepted term, and I tried to get different uh, views. Uh, the technological nucleus, uh, the country, le leading countries of the industrial revolutions. Uh, and um, the, the most, the, uh, the latest column uh, here, I tried to formulate uh, the list of technologies uh, which are uh, the core, uh, the technological core of uh, the fourth uh, industrial uh, revolution. Uh, this is all uh, discussable and could be uh, discussed in our uh, meeting today, but I wanted to draw your attention to one uh, peculiarity here, which uh, seems to me me is uh, quite important. Uh, you can see the red here uh, uh, in the picture here. We can see that the, every uh, uh, next revolution compared to the previous is shorter uh, than the previous. And the third industrial revolution 
The phenomenon uh, of uh, the acceleration of uh, technological, technological revolutions uh, resulted in that uh, in one lifetime a person uh, could have an industrial revolution or maybe two. And uh, this graph, uh, uh, this uh, picture shows us the model of uh, technological growth, the fourth industrial revolution uh, that is introduced as uh, one of the possible models uh, of uh, the development. And it seems to us that uh, the nucleus, the core of this uh, foundation on which we are going to build the future markets, these are the three key directions. Of course, these are not, techn not technologies, but technological uh, spheres. This is digitization, it's neurotechnologies and biotechnologies. And uh, two important uh, technological interviews. This is uh, virtual and augmented reality and uh, sensorics. And uh, these models, we can build uh, quite a lot of these kinds of models. These are this is one of uh, the models uh, which uh, demonstrate the uh, possibilities for the development uh, in the nearest uh, 15 years. And uh, I just wanted to draw attention that the serious transformation is happening economically or civilization uh, approaches the, uh, to the uh, life of humanity within the fourth industrial revolution. And here, uh, the most popular is uh, the approach with which uh, you can see on this slide, uh, on the left uh, bottom corner. So the sustainable development concept, uh, which uh, presupposes the accord of uh, society, uh, environment and uh, the e economics, and uh, the challenges which uh, human civilization should resolve and overcome. And uh, if... Uh, at, uh, we go one level down from that, the production level, the uh, production systems, the concept uh, the, of uh, uh, production 4.0 uh, in a compressed uh, uh, form, it's on this slide here, and here you can see uh, quite clear directions here, and I wanted to point out here that uh, as a part of uh, this production 4.0, what we can see, what's very important, the number of trends, uh, this is the total automation, trend of total automation, or robotization even, of industrial production, within which uh, there is uh, a number of uh, times increase of the productivity uh, and there is uh, new sources of, of uh, added value and this approach uh, from our point of view demands uh, requires uh, this scientific research and uh, practical understanding and building new models which uh, within which uh, we could uh, discuss uh, the issues of the economic uh, uh, growth uh, in sustainability in a broader sense. And on this slide, I just wanted to, uh, in quantitative uh, expression, I just wanted to show social economic trends of uh, digital transformation. Uh, reds are the figures, uh, the numbers which uh, are inspiring and awesome. Uh, first, that uh, in four years uh, we have uh, the growth, uh, twofold growth, according to the leading international expert. The second one, <coughs> this is also a spirit lifting story. And uh, well, a le less spirit lifting one is that over 30% of jobs uh, will be automated, which will result in Russia to the loss of uh, over 30 and a half million uh, jobs uh, in traditional industries, if we uh, would talk about it today, and 77% to, uh, uh, of employees within the uh, next uh, uh, five years, they'll have to learn new skills and totally requalify. From the economic economy point of view,
We see the change of uh, the economy model of uh, industrial production. I'm not going to comment on that. Uh, this is the upside down curve of the value added uh, uh, compared to industrial approach. Uh, uh, that uh, requires uh, uh, special understanding and modeling, and I'm just citing it here as just as one of the possible models which uh, could be used. Uh, another uh, interesting thing here, how the research sphere, the science sphere is transformed. They have these pictures, uh, different uh, pictures here. Uh, just one, this is a social, social sciences here. And uh, you can see here, this is interdisciplinary crossover and our uh, beloved economy and management is uh, Economics is uh, transformed to psychiatry and uh, psychology, and what we're going to be doing with that, I don't know, but we'll probably have to start the behavioral uh, management and behavioral economics uh, spheres that will have to be uh, uh, started in um, our research too. And the last uh, few phrases, these are the types of... Uh, uh, digital twins, uh, which have been developing for uh, last, in the last decade. Uh, this is total digital modeling of the life cycle at all the, its uh, stages. This picture, I'm not going to be talking too much about this one uh, because there's lack of time. This is the model of virtual enterprise. And if there are questions, I can answer them and comment on them. Uh, to uh, certain uh, elements, uh, and uh, again, I was asked uh, about the whether the universities are ready for the story. In our university, as uh, many other universities, uh, well, the leading universities uh, will uh, opening uh, the centers. Uh, ours is called the Engineering Center for Digital Technologies of Machine Building, where we develop and uh, implement the technologies of uh, digital uh, twins, and uh, I can tell you uh, that the volume of the Russian market is, uh, is over 100 billion uh, rubles. Uh, these are the technologies, these are the enterprises at the bottom that uh, started on this path. Our center has been established in, in November 2019. At the moment, the portfolio is uh, 200 million rubles in, uh, in the year, and there is a trend uh, for growth, uh, and it, it means that it is in demand, this technology, in the real sector of uh, the business on the last slide, uh, again, in our center, we are not lagging behind from uh, the world tendencies, and this is totally digital, totally distributed. We call it a Digital Design Bureau as a, a part of approaches uh, that uh, in the world it's called a model oriented, a model -oriented engineering system. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, Sergey, uh, thank you very much. And uh, I don't see any questions in the chat so f so far. Uh, there is one. And uh, the question from Alexey Tipuhin. Uh, digitization leads to the growth of uh, productivity and the flexible production system, uh, profitability of uh, small uh, enterprises. But the growth of uh, uh, productivity uh, should impact the uh, uh, policy of resources provision uh, and management of uh, the supply chain. How do you think the Russian management system, how ready are they to this uh, actual growth if it is achieved? Uh, thank you for, very much for the question is a systemic uh, question and in short i'll tell you that technically we're ready and uh, psychologically uh, not ready and uh, in, in terms of management uh, they are trying to prepare okay sergey as a comment again uh 2020 is a kind of a uh, watershed between uh, the two industrial revolutions and uh, the phrase of the classic is uh, always that the revolution should be in uh, uh, should happen in the mind in people's minds and 2020 uh, it seems that it may be well the, the sad this year as it may be uh, it probably will help the revolution in people's minds that only this trend for the development uh, has the right to uh, uh, develop the uh, digitization of everything and everything. So thank you very much. Colleagues, I can see 
Uh, there are no questions. Uh, Sergey, several, uh, Sergey, thank you very much uh, yet again. Um, your presentation, no, no, if no, we no. could, uh, can I, uh, can we distribute it? Yeah, of course, I'll send it to you. It will be made available. Now, dear colleagues, the next keynote is um, Vikas Kumar. Professor uh, uh, from Great Britain, and uh, he will be talking about digital transformation towards supply chain 4.0, opportunities and challenges. Uh, the keynote will be in English, but since um, we have interpretation, the uh, keynote will be interpreted into English. So colleagues, please uh, start uh, the video with the keynote. It's a interesting. very interesting topic. And, and uh, it has a, a huge uh, future. And, uh, and in our how we see it. view, the prospects yeah. for the, the development, development today are the beyond the horizons beyond of the horizon today's understanding, understanding of uh, contemporary understanding. On the 6th of October, there was a, a session on strategy with. Uh, uh, people from science, industry, investors, with the participation of the Department of uh, Informatization of uh, uh, Communications of the Sverdlovsk region and uh, some other executive uh, bodies, and uh, with uh, the administration of uh, plenipotential representative of the president in the Euro Federal Court, the uh, members of uh, uh, the committee, uh, industry committee of the State Duma on uh, industry and innovation and economy. Uh, so the questions that were raised, uh, there were participants uh, from three regions uh, uh, of the Euro Federal Order, and of course, uh, COVID uh, uh, interfered here. We plan to invite. Uh, uh, from different people from different regions of the uh, different federal uh, 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 regions from the Euro Federal Okrug, and the number of questions was raised um, the subject of digitization of industry. And at the moment, at the moment, uh, the information is uh, still uh, being processed and uh, the work is quite uh, uh, labor intensive, uh, so COVID interfered as well. In uh, we, uh, uh, some people got sick, and uh, at the moment the information is being processed. And I think that in the nearest future there will be some uh, data made available. And I'm going to repeat myself again uh, the multifaceted uh, question here, and I wanted to point out again literally a couple of points uh, the point number one is in that uh, the introduction of uh, a digital product raises the competitiveness of uh, this enterprise uh, beyond that or the system of that uh, uh, where it is introduced and the second question here is uh, uh, national digital sovereignty. That's the issue. And this uh, uh, issue is uh, involves competitiveness and uh, probably security, the secrecy. And it is to do with the fact, and um, that involves uh, the fact that probably the British colleagues that uh, today uh, will take part in the conference. And uh, it is to do with the fact that our digital product, these are portals and uh, software and the hardware, the iron so-called and the uh, either uh, it's either germ it's either american or german or japanese uh, made and uh, i just want to give the stage to our active member of our cluster 
who took part in the strategic session. Alexei, please, uh, stage is yours. He's got a presentation on this uh, subject. Алексей. Uh, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, hello. Hello. Uh, hello, dear colleagues. Hi. Yeah, we can hear you well, but we can't see you. Yeah, we can uh, now. I want to show you the presentation. And uh, so this is the interregional trade system uh, that is uh, um, done with the cluster. And what's the point here uh, in terms of production and the industry and organizing new products? Of course, the computers and digital platforms, they do help a lot. And um, to have new and old uh, products and uh, in terms of um, optimization of uh, supply and document turnover and uh, uh, ensure marketing support and not only uh, locally but also uh, interregional and international of course and one of the projects that would be interregional uh, trade service system the essence is uh, guaranteeing the remote deals in a non-exchange space because the exchange systems they are very convenient because they're automated and the deals uh, in terms of organization uh, organizing you can do uh, these transactions uh, uh, in in the remote mode and uh, quite quickly and if we use uh, this principle and production which uh, is broad broad range of uh, products uh, then we have distributed participants uh, um, uh, which would be joined with the unified uh, uh, reporting system System, financial system and uh, the lack and they have the total lack of uh, the uh, uh, inventory management so this logistics uh, becomes the key issue here so Sergey in terms of optimization of uh, supply chain is very timely it's right on uh, the uh, point here so just in time the supply of uh, needed quantities and multimodal supply uh, in the area Eurasian area this is the task that is um, quite important and uh, timely in terms of exchange system every system has two subsystems so this international um, trade service system has two parts this is the accounting system on organization so this is distributed warehouses in the territories and the system uh, settling account so these are the uh, uh, link accounts so between the participants and uh, uh, the innovation is in uh, here where we use the exchange principles the same as uh, at the stock exchange or a goods exchange but it doesn't involve the key uh, futures or oil or energy or you know the uh, commodities that are traded on exchange with but not not those we are the others the guarantees of supply so this is uh, the deal is tied up uh, in escrow or somehow until the the goods are supplied and the uh, consumer is satisfied so why is it convenient so the uh, deals could be instant and it could be organized uh, that the operations uh, the sales the starting up the production minimization of uh, uh, the remnants the residuals uh, the the issue the storage the logistics um, and the system itself is, in fact, one of the easiest source of investment because up to 40% of the economy of uh, the uh, territory is from uh, trading activities. And if we talk about the uh, trade and finance uh, operations, the risks are 
in a non-exchange deal if uh, the money is first as a risk of the buyer and if the goods are first uh, supply first then the risk of the supply and if there is a distance these uh, risks are increased when they are remote from each other uh, between the territories between the countries the bank system uh, uh, is responsible only for the payment and the suppliers the vendors uh, often uh, suffer when they ha when it is organized when the deals organized the format of participation this is just um, your normal exchange so when the management company is not is a non-profit organization so this is the uh, clearing for the deals the service company has uh, uh, provides the uh, communications for example we, we could see when there is a communication is broken what happens just now so this is the production logistics uh warehouses uh, uh, uh retail maybe the consumers maybe private people maybe companies and the states maybe the insurance of cargo transport companies and it's the same format uh, the access to the information that could be the annual fee logistics service again it's uh, uh, the support of uh, the system the maintaining the system um is just a little percentage of uh, the deals uh, that is invested into the development of the system. so the business model the access to uh, trade uh, uh, platform uh, the logistics and uh, from warehouse to warehouse log uh, logistics and the organization uh, fees on uh, uh, trades so it is diversified and the system makes it possible to supply uh, corporate production and um, um, wholesale supply within the territory in the Russian Federation and the international, you know, like a Europe. The Eurasian Economic Union and BRICS countries and the European Union within those territories and uh, marketing and support for uh, retail deals for small medium sized enterprises. You know, might be uh, the uh, uh, you know, state procurement, the governmental procurements uh, could be big and small uh, companies, multimodal logistics, uh, for instance. Uh, um, it could be like uh, Urea to Europe. It should be organized uh, the logistics uh, from the uh, factory, then uh, shipping it out, and logistics, and the transport, and then storage, etc. So, of course, uh, the insurance, uh, cargo insurance, is uh, has the potential, huge potential for this kind of system. Today in Russia, we have uh, five electronic uh, platform. Uh, there is an association, and the share of this market is uh, no less than 15%. Uh, when the system has been started up, and uh, uh, the uh, governmental contracts made in uh, 2019, uh, that's uh, uh, the laws 44 and 28 is uh, 31 billion rubles per year and we can see stable growth uh, in these uh, purchase uh, in this procurement uh, the supplier and uh, the purchaser uh, these are the mirrors this is the uh, accounting and settling account uh, current account and the deal could only uh, the, uh, there are uh, these deposits um, in the opposed directions uh, because if there is the goods deposit and there is a, a real uh, uh, item for the trade, uh, this is the real item for the trade. So uh, there is uh, no cheating, there is no derivatives uh, and the uh, banking uh, system is working uh, quickly and timely. And so there is the financial resources for the uh, funding of the deal. So this is the guarantee of the payment on uh, funding uh, logistics and the supply uh, for the participants of the system. So after uh, this has been done, of course, uh, there is accounting. Uh, there is uh, uh, on the way in uh, we block the account for we block uh, the money uh, we freeze the money at the supplier and uh, maybe it has to be done then um, that the goodwill of the supplier if there is a quality delivery there is no insurance cases and uh, taking um, 
uh, the supplier gets uh, the uh, guaranteed uh, money uh, according to the contract and then we then protect both sides of the deal both the supplier and the market uh, the market of demand is really broad here I'm not gonna give you about 57,000 uh, companies in just Sirlovsk uh, region uh, the typical of uh, uh, typical 1 million populated uh, Yekaterinburg there is a little bit more uh, one and a half trillion rubles um, in uh, 2019 and the territories like this is uh, 21 agglomeration and cities uh, uh, where the population is over 1 million and the uh, state procurement governmental procurement as I said the volume is uh, I did say again so if you say 15 percent so only the governmental procurement is uh, 4.6 trillion uh, rubles. If we talk about the number of uh, uh, cities over one minute, it's 430. In uh, China, it's uh, more than it. uh, India, 53, Russia, 21. And then you can see uh, following the list. And uh, it's very interesting. In uh, the US, is only nine cities. So it is more distributed kind of uh, thing. Is, uh, um, and the importance of the project is that there is a uh, economic uh, uh, with this digital system we, we provide the complete eco economic security for the participants and uh, for uh, the companies we prepare the interregional system for supply and uh, for the sales of the products of uh, uh, the company both inside the country and abroad organizing uh, large deals for corporate participants uh, this is a very important and economically uh, uh, de demanded uh, in any economy of any country and i wanted to invite uh, 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 very competent uh, uh, human resources and companies uh, to participate here and organize the project because in yekaterinburg we have a federal company integrator of uh, document turnover uh, based in Yekaterinburg, a federal uh, company of uh, the tax and logistics that again in Yekaterinburg, uh, expert and research potential again uh, and in the Academy of Sciences and in terms of logistics uh, Yekaterinburg is five uh, cities over a million population of 500 kilometers away, uh, closer than 500 kilometers and historically there is the transport way um, in uh, the Eurasia because it was transported along the rivers and Chusava gets to Volk Sea so to the Mediterranean so uh, I said goes to Irtish Ob, and uh, to China so in Irbit uh, the Yarmarka uh, the fair in Irbit is uh, older than uh, Nizhny Novgorod and uh, so there is this project uh, uh, is uh, three years old so thank you very much for your attention I will be happy to answer your questions thank you thank you very much Alexey, uh, thank you very much. And it was a very interesting keynote. And if we talk about the uh, economic needs here, uh, then there is a potential for interregional uh, interaction is colossal in our region. And these contemporary tools like digital platforms, they will help it a lot. And uh, if uh, are there any comments or questions? Um, Alexey uh, again he, uh, wanted to ask, uh, he wanted to uh, comment probably. Uh, turn on your microphone, the stage is yours, please do comment. Alexey, can't hear you. Alexey, we can't hear you, but the microphone is on, but I can't hear you very well. Alexey is in Orenburg. Alexey, can't hear you. No, can't hear you. Unfortunately, you can't hear. Well, in the chat, he uh, probably writes there are two new, uh, two new messages in the chat. 
what uh, how do you ground the optim optimal logistics how do you ground that uh, on the basis of your trade service system the uh, to get it optimal it is not possible glushkov claimed that you cannot automate chaos uh, deputy director uh, uh, kortov uh, said that we uh, the achievements of digital economy we cannot use in russia still are not ready so uh, you can't, uh, it's not achievable. So how do you answer that? Any systems, any systems are fostered and um, educated and trained psychologically and algorithmically. So there is, of course, there is this technological solution and um, there is organizational measures to do with technological solution. Uh, before there were digital accounting, accounting was on paper and there is this uh, uh, avalanche of paper, there was a huge numbers of uh, accountants were working on it, I'm not uh, going to tell you when, and, and it was the whole, there was a whole industry uh, that uh, has been replaced by just these just uh, 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 applications that uh, or uh, whole packages that people use in terms of optimization and organizing the work and logistical service, logistic services for instance this is again this is a product and services uh, on transport for instance and uh, it's the, it's the same and um, you know we mm, book the tickets uh, railway or uh, airplane tickets <laughs> you just uh, take your passport and go to check in when you buy it online so logistical it could be automated they could be systematized and organized for servicing from the consumer up and so this would be optimal and that is why i am saying that it is optimal so how it is, uh, so you take it on the shelf, uh, when it's uh, the goods on the shelf, it's very easy when they are arranged well. Alexi, there is a Victoria asked, uh, what are the risks of the projects? What do you see as risks? And in any case here, the risks are lack of funding and lack of training. And... Um, what uh, can we, um, well, the brain develops here, the human brain develops, the neuron connection, connections, they should be reinforced along the entire chain, the behavioral chain of uh, this system. And uh, that uh, unites the vendors and the consumers and the log logistics companies and warehouses uh, and uh, you have to get the entire chain ready with the support of uh, uh, governmental and intergovernmental standards and solutions. And this is quite uh, a, a long haul of a task. And uh, working on the startup of the system, uh, and then we take about three years of uh, the industrial implementation. If we talk about Google, for instance, what started in 2015, right? And then there was the organizational financial solutions. There was about three years was enough to start any projects, even international project. Uh, this uh, international uh, 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 experience shows. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And there is a comment in the chat from uh, Den uh, Denis Papillion. Okay, you can have a look at the comment we're going to move on. And there's a um, um, number two uh, to listen to uh, the to Saeed Nasratabati, a doctor of uh, St. Istvan University. So, colleagues, um, just a comment. Please turn on the Russian channel. You can choose English or Russian channel. So, please choose Russian channel if you want to listen to the interpretation. This is important.
Economics, Ural branch of the Russian Academy of Sciences, and her keynote is the digital platforms in industry classification and functionality issues. So, uh, please, Victoria Viktorovna, you have the floor. Victoria Viktorovna. A good day. I am glad to welcome the participants of today's conference. Uh, I'll be talking about digital platforms in industry and uh, uh, transformations. Uh, and we'll be talking about digital uh, platforms, especially when we talk about penetration of digital technologies into the real sector of the economy. So uh, currently, uh, the, there's a transition uh, to the digital uh, society and the transition uh, to the paradigm of the fourth industrial revolution is uh, goes together with network cross-industrial open vertical and horizontally uh, production and service ecosystems and the key science of such uh, ecosystems are three things modularity then distribution and wireless communications between uh, senses and uh, between senses uh, as of today uh, we're talking about three approaches to transformation uh, process technological and sectoral uh, Processual approach uh, make it possible to uh, implement throughput business pr uh, processes of uh, value uh, creation, starting with the idea and ending with uh, production, operation, and product utilization. The second approach is based on uh, technologies, uh, which are boiled down to two big groups, artificial intelligence and microelectronics. And a uh, final sectoral approach is uh, based on uh, identifying uh, the markets uh, which are based on digital technologies. So uh, digital platforms are used quite often today and depending on the context, uh, digital pl platforms are understood differently. For example, IT specialists understand digital platform uh, as a certain a digital environment and the population understands a digital platform as a marketplace. So a place where you can buy and sell goods like Amazon or online uh, services like Uber or Yandex Taxi. However, uh, the industrial platform is a more profound entity and the industrial platform is a system of uh, algorithmic relations of the market participants which uh, work within one digital environment which <clears throat> help reduce costs uh, by dividing the labor and it is the efficient uh, system of labor division and specialization of the companies within the sector uh, which differs a digital uh, industrial platform from a simple marketplace. And this is where I would like to give the definition, uh, saying that a platform is a cell of new industrial revolution. And these platforms, they will come to replace transnational corporations, which were the cells of the previous revolution. Hence, if the product has its own digital twin, in the form of digital uh, factory, then digital platform is a virtual model of the entire sector 
with all the issuing aspects, ensuing aspects. So it is the efficient uh, system of labor division, which uh, predetermines specialization of the company and standardization of the operating environment uh, and a reduction of costs uh, digital algorithms and innovations we also understand that the platform can be valuable only if there is a big number of participants and this is a uh, known law the more participants there are the higher the value quite often it is a small number of participants that can become a barrier and the reason of why a platform might fail to operate. So we have moved to the typology of uh, digital platforms in the industry. We're talking about two types of platforms. A platform, so the first type is the system, which is oriented towards creating value by direct interaction between a buyer and the supplier and uh, performing digital transactions between them. Here we're talking about two subtypes. Number one is information and communication platform, which ensures information exchange and uh, prompt communication. As an example, we can uh, give uh, digital catalogs of uh, products and catalogs of what a company can do. The second subtype is uh, transactional platforms. So they ensure financial and legal uh, support of the business deals. Here we talk about uh, procurement services uh, for public or business needs. Unlike the platforms of the first type, uh, platforms of the second type are more sophisticated. And the second type of platforms is a set of interrelated uh, digital technologies which ensure digital uh, life cycle of the product. Uh, on the one hand, on the basis of industrial internet, which connects industrial facilities uh, with each other. On the other hand, it's using digital twins. The basis of this platform is a product and its digital twin around which all participants uh, uh, gather. And uh, there's a manufacturing segment and a procurement segment and a consumer segment. Speaking about the evolution of these platforms, a uh, platform of the second type, it uh, follows, it is based on the platforms of the first type. And we're talking about five types, stages of uh, platform uh, building. And uh, so the first one is uh, primary information communication network. The second one is electronic data exchange and transactions between uh, network partners. At this stage, uh, there is a transaction platform. Also, it is the combination of Internet of uh, Things and the modulation of digital twins and artificial intelligence and uh, creation of the complete digital life cycle, which uh, results in uh, the platform of the second type as a business model of a product. Let's look at the statistics in order to better understand how much Russian companies today are prepared to implement the platforms of the first type. Like I said, platforms of the first type, they're based on digital communications and transactions. Industrial uh, companies, uh, they're nicely integrated into information digital flows, but we can see an interesting uh, paradox here. The uh, companies are included into the digital um, exchange with uh, suppliers rather than consumers. <coughs> And uh, more than 50% of the companies, they're using networks uh, to ca contact uh, the suppliers. At the same time, um, slightly over 68% of the companies are using internet to communicate with the consumers. At the same time, uh, the uh, greatest part in this exchange is digital exchange about uh, products and needs. And the companies which place orders uh, for the supply of uh, materials they're only 42%, and the companies which receive orders via internet, they're only 32%. So if we compare it to trade, then these uh, figures, where these 
figures are 90 or 100 percent then we'll understand how much uh, far how far the industrial companies are from the phase one uh, of digital transformation of industry and the completion of this transformation so example of the platform with the first type is the state information system of uh, industry and it provides different services services of the uh, trade uh, platform financial information services and you can place information about your products here by filling in the digital passport of the product uh, for the participation in the project activity there is also a marketplace also there is an information system which uh, hosts uh, main uh, as subjects of the industry and companies there are clusters and uh, many other uh, objects another example is the platform uh, of regional level uh, like uh, construction complex of St. Petersburg, for example. This platform comprises all stakeholders of the industry, uh, developers, construction companies, and there's quality assessment, uh, then governmental authorities and many other organizations. All that is uh, on the basis of a digital platform when all interactions, they are digitalized and all routine processes, uh, they are easily automated on the basis of this platform and final example of the platforms the first type is our procurement system our procurement system for state for public needs and the procurement system of largest corporation which include uh, where the largest marketplace is rosatom and uh, you will talk about localization so different scale from small businesses to large businesses let's move on to the platforms of the second type the second type of the platforms is a model of life cycle of the product and uh, this platform is used as a basis uh, to um, deploy families of products finished products and standardized components this model based on digital twin and using a standardized approach increases several fold the variety of products and it helps customize consumption we say that digital platform type 2 in develops around the life cycle of the product and it includes uh, such stages as planning design of the product and ending with uh, use and service and there are three layers the first is digital factory which covers uh, planning design of the product and planning of the production then is smart factories which add a serial production to the process and finally this uh, full cycle is completed by a virtual factory Here, uh, looking at the statistics, uh, we can also see how much Russian companies, uh, to what extent Russian companies are ready for the platforms of the second type. Like I said, the basis here is the use of special software. And 90% of uh, co companies are using special software. However, if we look in greater detail, then th we see there's a disbalance towards special software to address managerial and economic tasks. These are a legal basis and accounting. And there's a specific risk for industrial companies who are using software for research and software for design only 29%. Moreover, the CRM RP systems are used by one company out of four, so 25%. Special means uh, to um, administer automated uh, uh, production, uh, one company of two, and automated procurement, about 48% uh, of companies are using those. We also see that Russian companies today 
they are not uh, completely ready for platforms of type two and it's natural that uh, the drivers of this process can be state companies uh, which last year uh, suggested recommendations for digital transformation and these recommendations include the creation of standard platforms in this regard um, rosatom has advanced further than others because rosatom is a model of the entire industry in itself and they introducing digitalization programs and finally we can move on to conclusions in my view a digital economy as such it doesn't exist there are there is a digital segment of material economy so virtual environment which augments the reality and the digitalization is like a superstructure on a real sector it is the economy which is there to enhance the interaction of the between the uh, stakeholders of the um, production and uh, selling of the products so if an uh, introduction of digital technologies is done without sufficient development of material production then the overall economic effect of digitalization will not have a decisive value the level of development of a digital economy directly correlates with the development of material sphere. So it is only where there is um, these chains develop, the development of digital segment is more expedient. And we can confidently say that the opposite is true. The more uh, digital the process are, the more active impetus there is for analog services and productions. And finally, digital platforms are there to become the basis of digital transformation of industry as uh, platforms of the first type and uh, both the platforms of the second type and uh, the evolution of the platforms as such from the first to second type. This is it from me. And thank you for your attention. Victoria Viktorovna, uh, thank you. It's been a very interesting a keynote and uh, colleagues are there any questions i'm looking at uh, the chat box and uh, dmitry Volov. yes please you can ask your question uh, thank you uh, thank you Yulia georgievna and victoria uh, victorovna has presented a very interesting keynote and in essence this is one of the key areas of development of digitalization a uh, digital platform, in essence, like Victoria Victorovna has said, well, maybe I'll rephrase it a bit. It's a digital twin of the industry, of the industry, of the sectoral development. However, when when we talk about, but when we talk about digital maturity, which you showed the stages of digital maturity, and what I would like to see in the keynote is the interrelation between development of digital platforms and the big data technologies, which help analyze big volumes of data. In principle, I've seen some hint on that. It's predictive analytics, some forecast uh, with the help of digital tools and artificial intelligence. Nevertheless, I would like to ask the question about big data. Victoria Viktorovna, you have uh, talked about digital platforms as two types of value creation. Uh, so what place do you see big data in this concept with the possibilities of big data analytics of huge scopes of data? Thank you. Thank you. So we talk about two types of platforms, like uh, type one platforms, there comes communication and transactional platforms and big data use there. Well, big data there are not a key technology, but for the platforms of second type, this is where big data are the core. Because big data in industry, they're gathered with the help of a huge number of sensors installed on the equipment and uh, the industrial uh, product which is used by the consumers uh, hence a big scope of data this is where a big scope of data is formed so answering your question i'll say yes big data 
are used on the platform, but only on the platforms of second type. If we're talking about the first type, then this is where uh, the te blockchain technology can be used for transactional platforms where uh, stock exchange deals can take place. And may I ask one more question, please? Yes, of course. Okay, why have I asked about big data? Uh, so today, one of the factors of digitalization and value creation in the digital economy uh, is data as such. It's data as a product and the uh, data of uh, and the market of data brokers. So in your view, how, do you th how much do you think the Russian market and the Russian industry are ready uh, for creation within the sectoral economy? of uh, monetization of data. So purchase and sale of data, is it possible? I think even if it's possible, it's a distant outlook. Um, it's just a problem. Unlike the data we have currently in most industries, the data of specific companies and data of digital twins, they are commercial secret, they're closed. That's why openness of data is probably a key question if we talk about monetization. For example, if a corporation that is developing digital twin and if this company includes um, procure vendors and other market participants, uh, research organizations into its process and opens uh, these data for its consortium, then yes, we can talk about open data and the use of those data. But selling the data is a question about competition and competitiveness of the product of this corporation because if it's open then natural uh, naturally one cannot talk about uniqueness so you think this is connected with g digital with cyber security and commercial secret yes thank you very much for the answer thank you dmitry leonidovich there is a question from alexei tepukhin recently prime minister of russian uh, Federation Mishristin uh, said about the plans to uh, cut uh, the uh, civil servants in the administ public administration apparatus by 10%. Digital platforms is one of the tools to implement those plans. Is it real, in your view, to fulfill these plans based on digitalization? Because the previous attempt, as I understand, failed. Uh, thank you for the question. In my keynote, I talked about digital platforms in the industry and in the industrial sector, and you're asking about digital platforms in um, government administration and governance. Uh, so yes, uh, in the, within the government, there is this work on the way, and there is a federal project uh, aimed at digitalization of uh, public administration and such routine processes, which can be easily uh, transformed into algorithms and then handed over to a platform and artificial intelligence. Naturally, these things will be implemented, which will lead to reductions in personnel, uh, which is occupied at the uh, lowest levels of administration, maybe some specific specialists or public officials. So my answer is yes, it can lead to reduction of personnel in a public administration. Colleagues, a question from Dmitry Evdokimov. Uh, thank you, Victoria Viktorovna, for an interesting keynote. In your keynote, you talked about digital uh, industrial revolution. Um, my questions, in certain constituencies of Russian Federation, Camera, for example, they talk about the uh, industrial revolution, Industry 5.0. Can you comment? Can you give comments on that, th this very fact? Yes, there's another question about Industry 5.0, which will be a revolution in artificial intelligence. So right now, there is this understanding and maybe even a concept uh, saying that uh, a change in paradigms and uh, technical paradigms and revolutions, which we used to see as a wave-like process and gradual replacement uh, in different uh, revolutions, uh, then now quite frequently a change in traditions they overlap and it's very difficult to say where there is this border between third and fourth fifth and fourth and fifth revolution 
and it is true that uh, technology of artificial intelligence they will be a basis uh, for uh, industry 5.0 however right now these technologies are being shaped and on the stage of the fourth industrial revolution will already say that these technologies are used in different sectors of science and in, in the industry uh, that is why okay the question are uh, commenting uh, so in certain constituent entities it has been discussed this is wonderful but i think that it, we will not be the flagships here although our uh, physicists and mathematicians and quantum technology they are at quite a good level and uh, i think that uh, russia will have its place in the global market of these technologies and if in the industry 4.0 we are not in in the lead but maybe in the industry 5.0 we'll be able to occupy better positions so you think it's possible all right uh, dmitry uh, good day uh, dmitry from central uh, institution institution of mathematics it's great that you've joined us so there are no more questions here uh, to Victoria Viktorovna and I'm moving on to a very interesting uh, keynote and I hope it's gonna work he is Jafar Rezel PhD professor at Technical University Delft in Netherlands and the topic is decision making and digital transformation uh, Jafar, uh, we welcome you. You have the floor. And colleagues, I remind you, if you want to uh, listen to the translation of this keynote into Russian, so please choose the Russian channel. Uh, good morning or good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, okay. yes, Thank we can much. hear you. Uh, so uh, my, my talk is about uh, decision making and uh, digital transformation. Uh, I do not talk about uh, that much about uh, digitalization or digital transformation, but uh, I mainly focus on the impact of digitalization on decision making for individuals and also for organizations. My name is Jafar Reza, I am Associate Professor at um, uh, Transport and Logistics Section of the University of Technology in the Netherlands. And um, I have been working for uh, about uh, 15 years on uh, decision-making and decision-making tools, uh, decision support system. Uh, and my expertise is not actually digitalization or digital transformation. My presentation is, as I said, mainly about the impact of this on uh, decision-making processes. So uh, I'm not talking about digitalization because I think uh, all of you are experts in this field and everyone knows that uh, it has uh, impact on different sectors in society, uh, from healthcare to banking, agriculture, and transport and logistics. And um, uh, this is my area, transport and logistics, and I see many innovations in this area every day. So we see uh, the significant impact of digitalization in transport and logistics. And we always also face a question like many other states, whether it's good, it's bad. Uh, there are also discussions by, by philosophers um, whether we should go this direction or not and whether we can be friends with machine or there is a fight between us and machine and that is not the focus of my presentation. What I would like to discuss here is actually about a kind of philosophical question whether human is replaced by machine or not. And some argue that each human needs to be replaced by new human. So if we are like today, probably we cannot perform very well tomorrow and the, in the era of digitalization, especially. And there are different ways to go through this change. 
some argue the two as education and law and legislation. And I would like to focus on these two in the context of decision-making. So decision-making, uh, uh, what is decision-making? I think everyone uh, has a good definition of decision-making in mind. And, and that is the definition that you have in your mind, I think is a sufficient def definition for this talk. Uh, decision-making is a cognitive process of selecting one or a couple of alternatives from among a set of alternatives. That is a very simple uh, definition. Uh, you might have seen many different definitions, scientific definitions, but this is what we mean uh, by decision-making when we use it. Uh, at least until today, many of these decisions uh, have been made by human beings. And this is a transition that in the future, or actually currently, some of these decisions are partly or completely made by machines. And, and that, is, that is a change in the, in the field of decision making. So in this slide, you can see several steps of an effective decision making process. And there are different pictures like this, but this is something very generic. So if you look at this picture, there are seven steps for decision making. The first step is to identify the decision. What is my decision? What do I want to do? What do I want to choose? A second is gathering information. If I want to make a decision, I, want, I, I need to know, okay, what are the alternatives? What is the environment? What are the prices? What is the quality, et cetera, et cetera. And then I need to also know the alternatives. If I want to buy a car, I need to understand which cars are available in, in, in the market. And then I weigh the evidence, which means that I look at the uh, attributes in my mind, look at the situation, and I see, okay, I have two alternatives, and I go for this one. This is weighing the situation, which is followed by choosing one alternative, Finally, when I have one alternative, I take action, and at the end, I review my decision after a while. And I have this cycle many, many, many times uh, during even one day. We, we make hundreds of decisions every day, and not big decisions, but we, we make also medium to large decisions uh, every week or every month, but we, we make many, many of these decisions. So the question of what is my decision is under change. So today, or better to say yesterday, it was clear to me what is my decision. So as a shipper, for example, in China, um, I know that I want to send some containers from here, China, to Europe, through Port of Rotterdam. And then from Port of Rotterdam, I send them by truck to a warehouse in Germany. But digitalization is changing this process. And my decisions are also being uh, changed, for example, there is no longer my decision to choose whether truck or rail or barge from Port of Rotterdam to a warehouse in Germany, from port to hinterland. And why? Because of some new concepts in the field of logistics, like synchromodality. Maybe this word synchromodality is new to some of you, but it is actually a synchronization between different transportation modes. So as a shipper, when I send some containers to a warehouse somewhere, I just send them 
And I don't know actually what happens later. I don't know whether they ship it by truck or whether they ship it by rail. So my decisions uh, have changed. I have different decisions today. There is another a very exciting concept in the field of logistics, which is physical internet. Uh, maybe some of you know, physical internet is actually the way we can implement physical logistics like digital internet. So for digital internet, uh, you send behind your computer and you send a message uh, from your home to me, and I'm sitting also in my home. And this message, like a packet, is going through several different locations. But you don't know, I don't know, you don't care, I don't care, you don't pay for that, I don't pay for that. It's, it, this concept is also, uh, ha has received also a lot of attention in physical world. And in the future, in logistics, uh, the idea is that we also send uh, commodities, we also send containers from origin to destination without knowing and caring about how it's transported, uh, which is called physical internet. And this is just the beginning of this new concept some expect that in 2050, we have a complete uh, physical internet, but who knows? But it, if it happens, it means that my decisions have, have completely changed. This is not my decision to choose a carrier, to choose a, a freight forwarder, to choose many companies that I have used to uh, choose them before. The second step is to gathering information in decision making. This has also changed significantly and will change significantly also in future. Because today, as a, a, as a grocery shop, if I have some fruits and I want to change the price, I want to have some discount, I need to go to the shelf. I need to look at them. I need to evaluate their, their freshness and maybe I give some discount. And my discount in my mind is like 10%, 20%, something like that. There is actually a company here in the Netherlands. Uh, it is called a Rapid Pricer. And they use algorithms to evaluate the freshness of fruits and changing the price dynamically. So it is now the machine which collects actually all of these informations and also at the same time making the decision. It's not my decision as an owner or as a seller. It is the decision of the algorithm to find the, the, the optimal price or the optimal discount. And it is not like 5% or 10% or 20%, it can be 11.2%, which is optimal. Because I do not have too many alternatives in my mind. And that is another thing in, in decision-making. So as I said before, the third step would be to identify the alternatives. So if I want to make a decision, I need to know how many alternatives do I have? And I choose one of these alternatives among a set of alternatives. A digitalization has also changed this and is changing this step of decision-making as well. Because today, and more interestingly tomorrow, I have much more alternatives. One example was, for example, to uh, identify different discounts uh, for a grocery shop, but machine gives me many, many, many alternatives. Or if you look at uh, passenger transportation, 
because of all these uh, new technologies that we are using, now we have many different combinations for mobility also, which was not the case yesterday. And one of the biggest challenges in decision-making is the cognitive biases that we have in our brain. So we are prone to many, many different biases. For example, we have anchoring bias, equalizing bias, splitting bias, etc. And I have a map. I don't expect you to read this map. This is a map of all cognitive biases that we have in our brain. It is too many, right? We have 200 something biases in our brain and we cannot control them, but machine can control all these biases. Machine is not prone to bias. And then it means in decision-making, we can identify better alternatives and maybe also better weigh the evidence. Because as I said, it is also part of decision-making to see what are my objectives? What are my means objectives? What are the attributes that I can evaluate these uh, uh, different alternatives to see which one is the best for me? So if I have uh, the, the previous talk, I think was about platforms. It was in Russian I, I, and I cannot understand, but uh, I heard a lot of words, uh, uh, platforms. So if you have two different platforms, and you want to choose one of these two, there are many different features, many attributes to consider. And then you as a company uh, give importance to different features differently than another organization. So for you, uh, security might be the most important one, while for the other organization, other criteria might be. So, Digitalization, those platforms and many other things are changing also my evaluation. In the field of logistics, and I'm talking more about logistics because this is a field uh, I'm familiar with. Um, most of my ap applications are also in this field. In the field of logistics, we are giving much less importance to a very previously important attribute like control. So as a decision maker, I want to have control over my choices. I want to know which transportation mode transports my container from a port to hinterland. But using all these algorithms and new technologies, I delegate my control to so many other actors and they make decisions on behalf of me. But choosing among alternatives also, this is a very simple example of TomTom Tom, and it is not my choice. So it was not my effort to identify all those alternatives. And even now that I have to choose among these alternatives, in many, many cases, it is not my choice. This is a machine that makes decision for me. And I think some of you are familiar uh, with the talks of Professor Harari uh, from Jerusalem University and, and the, the, the author of the Sapiens. And he's also talking about giving all these authorities from humans to machines, to algorithms. So in the future, so in the past, the authority was from God and then from us and tomorrow uh, from data, from algorithms. This is good or bad, um, I don't know at least. And finally take action and review your decision. So you make finally a decision 
Uh, based on this navigation tool, you go to right or left, uh, you go to your uh, destination, and finally, it's time to see uh, how, how to review your decision, uh, and that review helps you in order to make better decisions in the future. And uh, I have a picture here from a discount card from one of the big retailers in the Netherlands. So when you want to benefit from the discounts, you have to scan your card and they gather all information from me. So they know all about me. They know all about my purchases and it helps them to better sell me. It doesn't help me, it helps them. But of course, it is nice if, if they can also use this to protect my rights also. So as I said, we need to change this human to a new human. And two things, at least in, in, in decision-making helps us. One decision, one is education, because <clears throat> the way we have learned to decide is really different than the way we need to decide tomorrow or even today. When I was a child, my decision making was completely different than today. And today is still at schools, at universities, we teach students which are useful for yesterday and today. They are not really useful for tomorrow because tomorrow people need to have completely different skills because many of these decisions from step one to step seven are made by machines and not um, humans. And, and finally, I think this is also from uh, your expertise that, uh, of course, law and legislation also plays a significant role. Uh, like I have this picture, Germany developing a legislation to be first to commercialize level four autonomous vehicles. And this is also the beginning of some really very fundamental and interesting questions of philosophy of thousand years ago, which should be practically solved today. Uh, how to solve uh, ethical issues uh, for autonomous vehicle, for example. Uh, these are not easy questions and no one expects to see uh, answers at least uh, easily. So thank you very much. This was my talk. And uh, uh, if there is any question, uh, yeah, okay. I didn't check my, yes. Uh, Jafar, uh, Jafar, thank you very much. And in the chat box, there is a question from Svetoslav Timashev. It's in English. Uh, Jafar, uh, do, do you see the question in the chat box? Okay. It's in English. Uh, yeah, there, I, I see a question. Although the choice is done by the algorithm, but somebody, maybe even you, are the author of the algorithm and you choose the op optimization criteria. So it is not totally true that you as the owner of the rental shop are uh, strange from the choice of alternatives. So what is your take on? Yeah, I think, yeah, thank, thank you very much for this question. And I, I fully agree that there is always some someone behind this algorithm and, and maybe in the future, a machine behind the algorithm or an algorithm behind an algorithm. I don't know, but, uh, but finally, at least the way we are going uh, seems a bit dangerous because I think we are very uh, excited about these new developments. Uh, these new developments have many, many, many good things, positive sides, but I think we have too much focus on the good side compared to the bad side. And if you are careful with that, if we, if as you truly mentioned, if we give importance to the person behind this algorithm, yeah, I, I fully agree with you that, that finally we can control uh, also our future. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Jafar. Yes, uh, people should uh, behind the criteria. So it's a big question. Jafar, thank you very much. Uh,
uh, thank you that you were able to take part in our conference. I know it's early morning where you are, and we're always glad to see you at our conferences because uh, the cycle of this conference will be continued. We um, do them once a year, and your keynote has been very interesting. Thank you, uh, dear colleagues. And next is uh, Ali. Mr. Lukin, Nikolai Lukin, scientific advisor, group of microprocess architecture, Institute of Mechanical Engineering, General Branch of the Russian Academy of Sciences. Nikolai Alexeyevich, are you ready? At 12, yeah, please, at 12 o'clock, we're going to move to another uh, line. So, Alexei, the stage is yours. And please, please, you know, with uh, we at 12 o'clock, we're going to move over to another side. So, well, hello. You can see, you can see the name of the title of my keynote. And this is uh, the content. So let's start. Today, microelectronics is a foundation of any digital digitalization. And uh, when it is malfunctioning, we will not be able to talk about digitization or any spheres of that. And what is interesting here is to have a look at various aspects uh, which are in the, tr in the trends of uh, development of microelectronics. <laughs> In 2012, according to the data of the Association of uh, Semiconductors, uh, the U.S. semiconductor industry, microelectronics was the second in uh, the uh, um, funding in the American industries. And uh, what is funded today, if we have a look, that is most advanced technology which we can uh, assess as uh, the size of microelectronic uh, components. Here you can see the top, uh, uh, this 5.7 nanometers is uh, uh, it's, uh, most funded. This is the map of the US and we can see, we can see that practically the entire area is, uh, it, it centers uh, design bureaus and uh, production. Next, where does the microelectronics in the US, uh, where is it going? This is telecommunications and computers, first and foremost. And the volumes are totally astronomical, 136 and 117 billion dollars. And of course, as, uh, uh, as uh, the association uh, mentions, uh, Today, there's about 241,000 uh, uh, people are employed, and one of the workers of semiconductor industry pro make, uh, provides uh, jobs for five uh, other jobs in other uh, types of industry. And if we analyze the development in five years of the microelectronics in the entire world, then we will be able to see them, for instance, China had uh, increased uh, uh, just to huge steps forward the funding into microelectronics. You can see the table here, and China is at the top there. And the US has not uh, achieved the growth in the funding there. And the percentage of this increase of this growth, it is possible that uh, it is quite high. Uh, Russia is the red here, 12 and a half. Uh, that is the annual uh, average. But look at the volumes. Look at the size. All the countries other than Indonesia are ahead of the Russian Federation. And that is the microelectronics in the world. That is the picture. Look at the microelectronics in Russia. If we, if you, if we look at the prognosis uh, to two, uh, 2030, then the growth rate, uh, that is the top line there, which is at uh, the 
uh, quite a good angle there. And this is the uh, the bottom line is just the percentage of growth for Russia. That is eight uh, percent of eight uh, percent in a year. Then this is the official data, uh, which is so in a strategy for the development of electronic industry in the Russian Federation until uh, 2030. So what do we have in Russia? That is five production companies and about uh, 40 design bureaus, design centers. And here you can see on the map of the Russian Federation, you can see the federal okrugs. And I want to federal districts, uh, if you will, uh, and I want to say that the majority of uh, capacity of design and production of microelectronics is in the central federal okrug. Uh, Volga and Northwest. So this is the west of the country, the west of the Russian Federation, including the uh, Ural Federal Okrug is uh, significantly less there. So this is the kind of peculiarity of the strategy for the development there. It is uh, the decree of 17th of January this year, and that is that is what's recorded there. We as a country are planning until 2035. This is the curve on the left to increase the volumes of the uh, of, uh, sales of Russian electronics, and the gray gray is uh, the sales to abroad, so exports. Um, ex the sales inside the country are changing very slow and the special markets their special use markets is uh, shrinking and the most recent data uh, to do with the strategy if 2017 uh, the share of the companies in the russian federation in the total was 20 uh, percent 26 uh, percent you can see uh, this is the share of the company in the Russian Federation. You can uh, uh, then adjust the uh, defense and the airspace industry. And up to 2030, our country is going to spend quite a lot of funding on the increase of the share of domestic companies in the total volume of the market from 26 to 32 percent. And uh, the development is ahead of us there and it could be measured as six percent and also we can see there the the depth of the russian market is not enough to get the um wanted share in the global market and traditional markets will not be able to provide and will not be able to provide the uh, needed demand for the russian products and it's not to do with the, the economics uh, this is with the level of technological development and uh, we note four uh, quite serious uh, uh, conclusion here. There are contradictions in the strategy. We all uh, know that the key trends in the development of any system, this is adaptation and decentralization and uh, existing capacities is all centralized. Microelectronics is the foundation of any digital solution. So. And when we talk about digitization, digitalization, when we talk about digitalization and this conference included, when we talk about the algorithm and software uh, aspects of this, and we must never forget that, and I'm telling you as a specialist, uh, the intellect system as are in the silicon, in electronics, a computer is a, a, a microchip. And if you take the microprocessors out of your computers and uh, if you try to put uh, domestically made ones, Russian ones, then there will be no more than 50,000 people left in Russia. And then um, the design of uh, smart microelectronics today is a very rare component for the education of engineering uh, human resources and uh, the most of the uh, efforts is digitization and digitization. This is the algorithm and software side and programming cannot be developed on uh, uh, microelectronic solutions that are lagging behind, outdated. So this uh, microelectronics has to be the part of it. So the effective digitization is impossible without the research and site support uh, because the new architecture of the micro microelectronic uh, solutions, that is the tomorrow trend for the development of uh, the entire 
a scientific knowledge uh, in the foundation of digitization. So uh, the conclusion is, what is the strategy for the provision of the support of digitization? So this is the trial. So this is the research in science, education, and industry. So we view uh, the contradictory development of digitization we say that uh, probably we should be talking a more uh, a particular thing. So the target uh, 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 object here is the built-in supercomputer. This is a mobile computer. This uh, uh, top uh, productivity is in the smallest mass uh, size and uh, power consumed. So you can see the applied tasks here. That is uh, uh, armament, telecommunications, traffic, and energy, and the key components uh, of the uh, built-in systems there's got to be the functional function oriented process these are highly specialized uh, processes computers which uh, quickly um, work on a particular algorithm through hardware uh, solutions on parallel data, data processing where do we need the peripheral calculations based on these kinds of processes? That would be uh, highly precise navigation, optical electronic systems, intellectual engine management. On the right, you can see uh, this, uh, this uh, a picture of a driverless car. And you can see about 10 navigation systems in this, in this vehicle and uh, uh, 20 different computers in uh, the rocket systems, for example, the missile systems, and you can see uh, the same type of uh, processes which make it possible to create uh, the uh, 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 the drones that fly without a pilot. And the ideal um, the reaction to this trend is we attempt to establish inter-industry center for the development of these real-time systems processes. Viewing the Institute of uh, uh, Machine Knowledge and the Radio Electronics and Information Technologies of the Federal University and the Semicat of uh, Automation uh, Center as uh, founders of this kind of center. And the center itself would be the research and the development establishment of uh, systems for uh, tomorrow's stage of the development of digitalization. I'm so sorry, and uh, here I've missed one slide, so we'll base our conclusions on what has been done already. For instance, uh, the Institute of Radio Electronics and Information Technologies uh, established a nanocomputer laboratory in 2016 and 2018, uh, the, it was attested here on the project of strategic academic uh, units, uh, which was aimed at the study of the principle of building and the development of uh, these microprocessors. And based on this uh, lab, uh, we uh, plan to establish uh, this kind of center which whose goal would be establishing new research spheres, new schools, and real projects. And, and then we tested it, and we had an order from uh, for the research work. And uh, the distributed team from uh, supposed uh, uh, found there's the uh, Machine Knowledge Institute and uh, the Automation Center, semi of Center. We developed uh, the model of this process and uh, a software package for the for the drone navigation systems. And today we have the micro process architectures in uh, the uh, Machine Knowledge Institute and laboratory of nanocomputers that I've uh, talked about. So this has to be has to become a certain start for the establishment of this kind of center. And this uh, kind of activity is one of the particular elements supporting this trend in uh, digitalization, which is the development of uh, the complete microelectronics. So uh, that is where I stop. Thank you very much.
Uh, Nikolai, well, thank you very much. And uh, thank you. Uh, uh, the, Ural, the Ural is very diverse, uh, doing not only the development of uh, trends of digitization, but also actual manufacturing, the material uh, basis for the implementation of digital technologies, uh, including this intellectual in, uh, smart systems. Uh, so colleagues, are there any questions? to the uh, speaker, and I think that uh, the questions are there, but I think that our discussion, we have a separate site for our uh, conference, and this discussion is going to go on in an, um, there, and uh, colleagues, uh, uh, so the first uh, part is over, and I think that it was very diverse, uh, multifaceted from uh, digitization trends to uh, delineating of the urgency of establishment of digital platforms, methodology, and of course uh, the uh, material basis of uh, this. Uh, and uh, these uh, uh, keynotes that we had here, they will be all on YouTube and sent, uh, the links will be sent to you so you can actually get it from your mail to get. Uh, and to listen to these keynotes. And now I'll probably uh, give the stage to uh, Victoria Agberdina. She is inspired it. Uh, e Victoria, uh, she is, uh, uh, she's gonna start the second part. Good day, colleagues. Um... Now I'll be moderating and I'll be moderating the second part. I'll be moderating the second part and we have a big number of speakers. I, many of them I see among the participants and I would like to, uh, do we have uh, Sorin Gabriel Anton among the participants uh, from Romania? Mr. Gabriel, Mr. Gabriel Anton, are you among the participants? Well, maybe he hasn't connected yet, then uh, we'll start uh, the work of our session and I would like to give a floor. Alexey Petrovich, you are getting this screen ready. Your keynote will be for later. It's planned for later. Your keynote is planned for later uh, because we'll uh, stick to the program and I would like to give floor to uh, Professor Enrique Bonson, a University de Huelva, Spain, and his keynote, Artificial Intelligence Disclosure in uh, the Annual Reports of Spanish IBEX, uh, 35 companies, that's the study for 2018-2019. Professor Bonson, please, you have the floor. Colleagues, if you want the translation into Russian, you can select uh, the globe and choose the Russian channel. Professor Bonson, please turn on your sound. We see the video, but we cannot hear you. Please turn on your sound. Okay, good morning, everyone. Can you hear me now? Sorry, sorry about that. Uh, well, so first, uh, uh, let me introduce, can you see me screen, my screen? Yes, we can hear you and see you well. Everything's good. Yeah, perfect. So let's see if I can. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for having invited me to this uh, important uh, event. Uh, I would like to introduce you my the research we are conducting right now. This is a part, so please uh, uh, let me uh, give me uh, give you some context on that uh, research. 
So first, this is uh, we we are convinced that um, a non-financial reporting disclosure in Europe needs to regulate uh, artificial intelligence narratives in annual reports, artificial intelligence uh, disclosures. It has to be regulated because at the at the moment it is like a voluntary activity and uh, taking into account that there are developments regarding uh, ethics guidelines for trustworthy artificial intelligence and there is uh, some attempts of regulations by means of the white book on artificial intelligence which is the starting point for artificial intelligence regulations in the european union so we, we try to explore what uh, the current uh, practices or in artificial intelligence disclosure are by means of the main uh, companies, main uh, European leading companies. And of course, we started uh, analyzing the practices in, in our country, although we have developed uh, more research in Germany and uh, France and Italy and now we are exploring the whole European Union because we have developed some tool to automatically mine the PDF files with the in sustainability report. So it is our belief that uh, uh, by exploring these practices, we would be able in the short term to make a proposal uh, regarding the content that uh, has to be disclosed no? in, in terms of the of both the uh, to what extent companies are following the ethical guidelines uh, or they are issuing their own uh, uh, principles to report artificial intelligence uh, disclosures regarding uh, automatic decision making processes uh, mainly those processes that have uh, an impact on human beings. Well, what, what are the questions, uh, research questions in our research? First, are companies disclosing artificial, about artificial intelligence, what they do? Uh, what are they talking about in general, risk, ethics, products, uh, services, and so on? Uh, which are the projects that uh, they have launched? Uh, which are the products they have developed? Which are the AI ethical principles that companies are following? Uh, within uh, and if they are disclosing this in the annual or sustainability reports and finally the progress no well what what is the methodology well first we are collecting or we collect all the uh, annual reports sustainability reports and uh, we now we are doing this through the through text mining processes but this was the first the first survey we conducted to to define a dictionary to do it automatically so basically in this case this was done manually so we look for them for the for the keywords that you can see there regarding uh, concepts related to artificial intelligence machine learning deep learning and big data uh, every mention was classified according to pre-established categories and uh, based on the uh, asylomar principles and the european uh, union uh, guidelines for trustworthy artificial intelligence, the opinion of the data ethics commissions of the federal government of Germany and the white paper on artificial intelligence. We analyzed the uh, reports of uh, IBEX 35 in Spain and, and DAX 30 companies in, in Germany to extract also evidences on ethical approaches to artificial intelligence as a part of non-financial disclosure. So this is the dictionary we, we are using right now after this manual analysis. Uh, we are using a dictionary based on bi uh, bigrams, uh, using the keywords you can see on the left side, and then the associated words. This is, um, well, we have a paper describing more concretely this, uh, this mining processes. Uh, we call it mining artificial intelligence, intelligence ethical disclosures from corporate reports. No, and then, well, basically this is uh, how we do it. <clears throat> it is uh, written in R code, and it it consists on reading the PDF files, and then uh, through the extraction process, uh, we create the vectors and 
and applying the, the Bigram Dictionary, then we are able to identify, identify uh, sentences containing these uh, keywords, uh, and then we uh, analyze that sentences. Well, let me show you the results for, uh, the results for uh, IBEX 35 companies in Spain. As you can see, you, uh, the evolution from 2018 till 2019, and then the different categories. So who is, uh, who is talking about what? Know that there is an in, in, increase in the, in, the, in the disclosure. So more companies are disclosing uh, general statements or they uh, declare that they are using artificial intelligence applications. So basically there is a growing trend in, in all the categories we, we have identified. And uh, well, regarding ethics or regarding risk, risk analysis, you can see that still uh, no companies are not, uh, this, at least they are not disclosing uh, the risks that they are facing by using artificial intelligence tools. And regarding ethics, there is just a single company, I would, uh, which is uh, Telefonica, the, the telephone company in, in Spain, the leading company, uh, they have even created their, their own artificial intelligence uh, principles to as a way of uh, disclose that they are doing things in an ethical and uh, appropriate way. Uh, well, there are some other companies that um, are um, make, presenting statements regarding ethical issues of artificial intelligence, but uh, basically the, the, the main company in that field is uh, Telefonica. Well, let's see the evolution. Companies not uh, disclosing at the moment, uh, the, the number of companies with no disclosures has decreased importantly, right? So from 23% till 9%. Then the, to, to some extent, all other uh, categories are uh, reported by, by the companies. So you can see here, according to uh, every, every category we have uh, declared. And in this slide, think that uh, we have no too many time to, to develop this, but uh, you can see uh, the different categories in which we classify the applications that uh, companies, so the get type of application uh, regarding the, the, these categories that normally are identified in the field of artificial intelligence and uh, together with a brief description and the, the company which is, uh, which is um, uh, using this uh, application. And while well, the main uh, labs or units that uh, we have found. And well, basically regarding the uh, ethical aspects, uh, we have um, uh, identified uh, by means of this analysis, I was exploring the, f the following, no, this, uh, uh, aims that uh, companies are declaring. So for example, to develop social impact projects using artificial intelligence in an ethical and responsible way, it's a bank of Sabadell. Um, ethical issues in the use of artificial intelligence are also identified by Kaik Saban in 2019. And these are the, the artificial in intelligence principles of Telefonica. Uh, basically five principles they, they try to, they are targeting. Uh, they are looking for uh, applications uh, not creating bias or inequalities in the, in the, in the users, uh, being transparent and explainable, human-centric artificial intelligence, privacy and security by design, working with partners and third parties in the sense that they are, they are asking the partners and third parties to follow the principles that they apply to themselves. Um, well, basically, according to the categories established by the European Union guidelines, which you can see, you can see here, uh, then Telefonica is uh, more or less following all the, all the principles, no? And, and finally, this is, um, what the German Data Ethics Commission uh, um, states uh, according to the level of risk, the potential for harm 
uh, applications have to be classified in different levels uh, from level zero for, for example, chatbots, uh, which have no impact on, uh, they cannot cause, cause harm in, in the human beings still the high uh, level high uh, risk applications that they propose even to uh, partially or completely uh, ban uh, this kind of algorithmic uh, systems well in conclusion because i'm, I'm thinking i think uh, this my time is is over uh, the AI, ai artificial <clears throat> the artificial intelligence reporting activity sorry <clears throat> is growing as um, it is becoming more used in, in companies. Uh, this reporting is growing in a non-structured way. And uh, uh, regarding the ethical approaches to artificial intelligence, we, we, we have evidence that the, it is at a very preliminary stage, but uh, we believe that it'll, it will become a key point in the non-financial reports of companies uh, in the forthcoming years. And, and we try to contribute to this structuring of this information. It, uh, it will become uh, important to have specific subsection on artificial intelligence in the non-financial information section of the annual reports. And uh, we are, we are uh, clearly working in the uh, guidelines in, in creating a set of guidelines on, on what information is relevant and mandatory for companies to report and what ethical principles or regulations these uh, artificial intelligence applications must comply. So that's, uh, that's all for the moment. Um, uh, let me introduce you to my co-authors, Victor Alejo, which is currently uh, my PhD student at the University of Huelva and Domenica Laborato from Naples, University who is working with us. She was visiting us uh, under the PAD program of the University of Naples. So thank you very much for your attention, and I'm 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 happy to answer any any question you can you can have. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Benson. A very interesting keynote in Russia. As far as I know, there is of presenting non-financial uh, information using AI. Uh, there is no such practice in Russia, so they are well in the very beginning. So could you tell us, please, on one of the slides, you show the information that during the period from 2018 to 2019, the companies which previously did not disclose information about artificial intelligence, the number of those companies uh, reduced uh, twice. So more companies are disclosing now. What do you think is the main reason in changing the behavior of the companies? Is it regulation or is it voluntary desire from the companies to disclose information to improve their brand, for example? Well, at the moment, uh, there is no regulation on that. So basically, it... Uh, it uh, is uh, be, uh, because of the of the influence of the of the European Union guidelines because there is a trend to to regulate artificial intelligence. So leading companies, for example, Telefonica, they are playing a very active role in that uh, in that field. So they are they are not the leaders in in ethical disclosures on artificial intelligence in Spain, but also at the European level. So they participate in in the in the most important fora. Uh, to in that direction, uh, then I think that is uh, uh, it is like at the beginning of the of the sustainability reporting, no right? Uh, so leading companies need to legitimate themselves, no, and then they 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 clearly try to send this positive message to the to the markets in in, in general, not to to gain legitimation. So. Uh, well, first, and, and then on the other hand, more companies are using artificial intelligence uh, algorithms and, uh, and tools. So this is uh, why they are uh, reporting more. But uh, we need to differentiate what is uh, marketing, what is uh, ethical washing, as we uh, normally say, from, from what they have to do. No? And, and we are in that direction. So it has to be regulated. It has to be included, like uh, uh, digital corporate responsibility 
is at the same level that corporate social responsibility. So digital responsibility is, is here, right? So, so uh, we have to uh, state uh, what, uh, what elements, what, what is the disclosure that companies have to provide because this is very interesting for, for stakeholders. You know, the, the implications of algorithms in automatic decision making, for example, it has to be very clear. So we see one of the e elements to be to be reported is uh, what kind of uh, automatic decision making processes do we have? We have implemented that, and what are the implications? What are the risks? Uh, what what is the assurance? Who, if there are external parties uh, providing uh, some kind of assurance on the uh, on the appropriate uh, performance of that kind of algorithms? These these are the, the things that we are thinking about. And, and basically, we are also at the at the very beginning of that, no. But this is the reason why we have decided to open that kind of research line, which is seems to be promising. Yes, there is a question. Yes, please, Svetlana Vladimirova, Professor Obonsa. Uh, thank you very much for your uh, report. It's a very interesting one. And uh, my question is, what do you think? How artificial intelligence depend on financial result? How artificial intelligence depends How will artificial intelligence uh, will how will artificial intelligence influence a finan fin the financial result and vice versa? How will financial result influence artificial intelligence? Well, it's a, it's a good question. It's a very interesting questions. Uh, well, uh, for me, it is clear that artificial intelligence applications are going to increase uh, companies' uh, productivity, right? Uh, this is uh, in the in the field of optimi optimization and a lot of uh, applications that uh, could uh, impact the results. The second question is more difficult. No, it's uh, I mean how the 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 financial results uh, can influence artificial intelligence. Well, basically, if if a company is more profitable, they can invest more, and and then this like a snowball. No. <laughs> so uh, this this is this is a, an interesting point. We have we haven't uh, uh, thought on that uh, properly, but uh, no doubt that uh, we need more reporting. We need companies to disclose because there are a lot of uh, impact on the on so, in society, or it can it can have a, a big impact on on social uh, questions, right? So from hiring people. Uh, to make decisions that cannot be fair. So not, not everything is financial result, no? Uh, we have to think in terms of the triple bottom line, no? So we have uh, uh, financial results, but also social results and, and uh, environmental results that are, I think, uh, very, very important too, no? So thank you, thank you for your question. It's a very interesting uh, question, thank you. Uh, thank you, colleagues, very much. Are there any more questions to Professor Banson? If I may, uh, good day, colleagues. Dear Professor, could you tell us, please, what risks do you see in using artificial intelligence uh, for in environment? Because you mentioned about environment, and this is a very relevant topic. So could you tell us, please, what risks do you see for environment? in terms of artificial intelligence? Well, um, we have to identify both risks and opportunities, you know, because, um, uh, well, we, we, can, uh, we can use artificial intelligence to identify uh, uh, environmental issues. What, what are the risks? Uh, well, basically, it depends on the applications uh, that you, you face, no? If, if you... Um, are um, using artificial intelligence in a non-ethical way, 
uh, then you you can and and these applications have an impact on the on the environment it it, it is uh, clearly a risk so but in the ethical principles of the of well ethical principles i am mentioning the european union because this is our our main reference but uh, you have uh, uh, a good number of uh, international uh, organizations uh, making some pronouncements on on ethical use of artificial intelligence starting with the IEEE institute and uh, asylomar principles uh, um, artificial intelligence for good and and so on no unesco uh, united nations so so uh, this is something that um, of course risks are there and uh, and uh, but um, we need to to we need that kind of of principles for sure and uh, following the principles and providing um, certainty that uh, you are doing this. I mean, I'm, I'm talking about assurance services. So, so it is not that you declare that you are following the principles. It is also an external assurer, an external validation or verification entity, which is uh, uh, like an, an auditor, no? That like is certifying that you are doing things in the right way uh, but in the other hand on the other hand you you can also find um, a lot of uh, applications that are um, they are trying to to put together uh, data coming from the public sector and the private sector and um, these are initiatives to try to to analyze the impact in the environment on the environment on the different um, uh, uh, behaviors or or different uh, elements no so in, in this way also it can be used to 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 benefit the environment it depends of course i hope uh, my your question is answered so if uh, you have yes thank you very much thank you very much i uh, see there are no more questions in the uh, so professor bonson thank you very much yeah okay uh, thank you thank you and, spasiba, spasiba. Uh, uh, i will uh, i'm happy to to be here uh, and now uh, the next uh, keynote speaker is alberto Cereza. Uh, Narvaez, uh, Universidad de Cedis, uh, Spain. Professor Narvaez, I saw you among the participants. Are you here? Are you ready? Yes, I am. Okay, yes, I am. I'm going to... Very well, then you have the floor. One second, please. <laughs> Hello, everybody, and first of all, warm welcome to the conference. I hope very much that despite of this being a virtual event, that you all will enjoy the, each session and interactions and, of course, a communication with your colleagues and hopefully fruitful collaboration all across this event as well as after in years to come. First of all, I'd like to say thank you to Professor Kuzmin, conference chairs, for giving me this wonderful opportunity to say hello to all of you, to join the event and to introduce my brief talk, as well as basically, hopefully inspire all of you to seek solutions and best possible policies to make sure that technology is serving to everyone, that technology does not abuse, that technology basically today follow free robotics laws that we learned many years ago. 
Technology should not harm, technology should not abuse, technology should basically listen to humans and humans should be the final decision maker on how technology is implementing its features in any dimensions. So first of all, I'd like to say thank you and welcome and would like to introduce a very briefly keywords of my talk. We live in the age of COVID. COVID-19 have changed and unfortunately still is changing the whole world. The numbers are increasing quite dramatically and I hope very much as all of us that the scientific medical community will find a best medication and remedy to heal any illness related to COVID as well as to prevent any possible illness. At the same time, I also have great hopes for vaccine and hope that will, it will prove to be 100% effective and helping people to basically continue with their lives without fearing of possible contracting a virus. So indeed, COVID-19 as a result of these huge numbers, we see that medical establishments are overflown. A lot of hospital capacity is beyond the limits. And of course, any technologies, any medical personnel would agree that hospital today, it's not just medical doctors, nurses, patients, but to very large extent, a smart computational technology is combined with the Ethernet that facilitates fundamental collaboration between doctors, experts, consultants, radiologists, remotely or within the specific area via local metropolitan wide area networks. And so fundamentally we see that connection between medical fields and computational fields. Now, of course, as computer scientist and engineer, I like to think that computers could be built to a certain degree of perfection. And we see the gradual generations of computing from the very, very simple electronic tube-based computers or even far beyond that a Babbage concept of computing showed us that any machine that is capable of computation can become or is a what we know today computational device. Now with the third millennium that we live in what we see is that degree of smartness and degree of smartness means that we often say a smart cell phone and regardless of make I somehow found that that concept of smartness, smartness is perhaps a degree of certain capabilities or functionalities that that device is capable of and of course it's very hard to compare the computational smartness versus human smartness or intelligence. In the field of AI and smart robotics we see humanoid robotics like Sophia where these machines have now even the appearance features of humans. They behave, they express certain degree of emotions and human-like behavior patterns and of course fundamentally they are just electromechanical devices, computational devices that are programmed and of course in that degree of being able to be programmable they also are learning through the machine learning so they have that graduate progression 
that we often compare to a small child, a baby that learns to walk and talk and eventually going through stages of being adolescent and adult. Now, we see also in computing similar pattern. So that's math computation or what I like to use for the third millennium term ultra smart computational devices that will be able to basically perform so many computational tasks in very short time and yet at the same time being invisibly or almost in pervasive manner, interconnected ubiqu in ubiquitous manner to all devices all across the planet. And that connectivity is provided through the Ethernet. Of course, many people refer to Ethernet as a cloud, or not too many people, of course, non-technical, have clear understanding what the Ethernet is. But fundamentally, and you see the examples of Facebook and Google and huge data centers all across the globe. So these are buildings with servers and storage um, devices and computational devices and networking devices. And of course, they all are interconnected and that information that we share, such as this particular video, combination of voice, multimedia image and of course you may see some textual data or some colleagues in their presentation surely will use PowerPoint presentation or refer to Ethernet links. So this is a multimedia context presented in the basically through this codec or decodec on your side as a video of my lecture. So we have COVID, we have smart cyberspace, or very often cyberspace is often defined as space of cyber where things are interconnected and we'll see the trends that there are different levels of cyber infrastructures and of course very often we refer to cyber critical infrastructures such as atomic power plants, chemical plants, military government establishments, financial institutions, etc. where information or data are critical for that particular either domain or government or a country. Now of course the Ethernet have evolved. Initial idea of Ethernet was to share the information. And Professor Kleinrock and colleagues at UCLA and of course on the East Coast, MIT and Boston, they all work on that, uh, same colleagues in UK, on connecting computers so they can share information. And initially as Ethernet was developed, similar to a highway infrastructure, it was, it was developed without any idea of being or, or any need for any security, whatever. So the idea was to share the information, but as Ethernet have evolved and what we see in the last couple of decades or more than 30 years ago, we see that kind of introduction of cyber threats, cyber crimes, cyber attacks. And of course, that is part of, or that is result of that very complex, interconnected, very smart computational infrastructure that ultimately becomes vulnerable because as we have in this different parts of infrastructures, different layers compared to communication layers like OSI stack or computer architecture layers and we see that at each layer there is a certain collections of protocols and technology rules that must be implemented and yet within all these layers there are loopholes and possible basically cyber security threats and we know OAPS introduce system most critical cyber attacks 
And of course, there are many other cyber study centers where there are computer scientists, computer engineers, electronic engineers, hardware, software maker, who actually work together and try to figure out how to secure a very complex infrastructures, which are combinations of hardware, software, and various applications. Apart from all these technical details, there's another factor and another dimension and that is a human factor. And that human factor is perhaps the most complex to understand, to comprehend and also to control. Now, <coughs> I like to connect this concept of COVID and yet unfortunately, most tragically, COVID is just one example of human tragedy. Given the time that all this going on, we are in the age of cyberspace, of smart internet, of fast interconnected world. And of course, apart from that, we see developments of these ultra smart computational devices. And of course, a small cell phone, like you know, new generation, very recent generations of iPhone or Samsung or similar smart telephones, they are almost equivalent to supercomputers if we go 40, 50 years back. And so we see that increase of computational capacity at the same time complexity and interconnectivity. Apart from all these very fundamental pillars of technology, there is 5G technology. 5G technology that actually promises much higher bandwidth, much faster interconnectivity, and fundamentally perhaps a creation of fully automated cyberspace. In that fully automated cyberspace, our homes will be controlled by computational devices. Your fridge, of course, your garage, your house temperature, your gardening system, surveillance system, whatever. We also see that subject to domain, academia, governments, military, industry, business, there is all these different policies on how to define what is secure and how to maintain that security. So the third millennium is yet a wonderful time for see, you know, technologies and scientists and researchers to see how this technology has evolved and how it's evolving, how it becomes more smart and basically just limitless in its functions, but at the same time, we become more and more concerned about security because, of course, all these episodes or examples of cyber attacks and cyber threat compromise fundamentally principal values for any victim of any kind of cyber crime. As a professor, as an educator, engineer, I like to think that all educators, all scientists, to some extent, we are like brothers and sisters. We work together, researching solutions, we trying to understand and decipher very difficult and complex issues, and we try to find the most possibly available and also most possibly applicable solutions that may benefit mankind that may benefit people regardless where they are on this planet and of course the some people say world is becoming like a small oyster but yet the world is quite big enough you know I can imagine you know Russian Federation it's a large country it's just enormously large country and of course Canada is a very large country and, and US and China and India and, and, and you know even if you look at just Kazakhstan on its own it's a huge country 
and of course all these different dimensions, geographic dimensions, are disappearing with the Ethernet. I can watch TVs directly now, anywhere on the planet, I can see what's going on. People have information almost instantly, they know exactly what happened five, ten minutes in Moscow, in Johannesburg, in um, Sydney, Australia, in Alaska, and of course that creates that yet another kind of generation of cyber mankind where we are so much emerged in cyberspace. Of course I like to think I'm a generation perhaps that was born a little bit sooner than generation after. And of course the perceptions might be different and uh, you may agree, you know, some people that, uh, you know, we used to do everything in writing and uh, making notes. Nowadays, looking at students' population, it's very rare that they use notes. So in other words, as we look at the challenges of securing infrastructures that may impact human lives in the field of medicine, in the field of national security or in the field of any atomic um, power plant or chemical plant disaster malfunction. We also like to look at you know cyber security in the context of making sure that the exams are secure, the solutions are kept private or not available to students before they do the exam or during the exam. So there are many different dimensions of urgency for security. And of course, I believe that this conference brings together experts, distinguished scholars, such as yourself, in many different areas of electrical, electronic, computer engineering, science, information technology, information systems, technologies, AI, robotics, and far beyond. And of course, as the presentations throughout this event will become very, very focused and much more technical than my brief introduction, which I like to consider as an umbrella just to see what may fit in it. So you see through these presentations that there are connections and I would like to encourage you to create these connections and to ask difficult questions perhaps to make sure that you get the best possible answer and that also that we create what we call a multinational global research teams. Hopefully technology will and should and must contribute to human mankind and I can think of two fundamental applications. Number one, of course, COVID health application. Many years ago, some years ago, I used to work in South Pacific with Japanese colleagues and we were building the ICT center that would actually create or be foundation for communication kind of satellite hub that will connect all the small islands all across South Pacific. And of course, the region of South Pacific is huge. It's very large. And that there will be two fundamental applications for these interconnectivities. Number one, health or telemedicine and distance learning or e-learning. Now, of course, all these applications require very specific bandwidth because you have a lot of multimedia data and you want to often use applications that are close as real time as possible. And so that is limited because, of course, satellite connection uplink and downlink is much less faster than any fiber optics connection somewhere in Singapore or Hong Kong. And so giving this kind of technical challenges to connect satellite communications to Ethernet connections such as Ethernet on the ground, etc., is challenging for people who may have less privilege as far as finance, as far as economies that are much weaker than some, you know, say more developed countries. And of course, this is where I like to 
encourage all of us to work together to seek solutions so that we may also promote that education and give access to education, not just in the large conglomerations of large cities, but to child, any child on the planet equally. And of course, at the same time, the health should be available to any, anybody on the planet without any form or kind of discrimination and of course without any kind of excuse saying, oh, I'm sorry, we cannot treat you because you are not here or you're not over there. So I, of course, I'm a professor. I like to be considered myself as an idealist. So I, of course, aspire the best, perhaps to some extent, naive solutions, but hopefully solutions that make sense for any decent, any good person. We teach people to be good. We teach students to be nice, to be good human being. And of course, can we teach machines to be nice and to be good machines? <coughs> we see a couple of examples, and of course, the Hollywood always like to kind of jump ahead with the AI movies and very you know similar kind of move, almost action movies where technology takes control of people. During my Masters of Science graduation ceremony in London in 1991. It was my second master, first master I got in electrical engineering uh, some years back. But I remember a professor who was awarded Doctor of Science degree in, in London and during his inauguration he mentioned that technology had reached the degree where instead of serving people, it begins to mechanize the relationships. To some extent, it begins to control the humans or dictate how humans should act or behave. And so that is fundamentally challenging because as scientists we should make, we should all make sure that technology contributes a better life, a betterment of mankind all across the planet. And so with that respect, I think this is important to be open-minded, to be willing to sit down with the sociologists, medical doctor, psychologists, people outside our discipline and listen to their concern, listen to their perceptions. And then we go back down to very rigorous, mathematically, technologically, you know, foundations of, of these issues and try to solve it. Apart from that, I think it is also essential as educators and researchers that we promote the rigor in education, in curriculum, that we encourage students and that we encourage them to love mathematics and physics. Because of course, world without mathematics and physics would be something that we can't even imagine. I would hardly be able to imagine it. And of course, mathematics, if it introduced as a foundation of science and engineering, then it will be easily liked and loved by every student. And of course, both combination of mathematics and physics actually introduces students to a much better understanding of how the universe, how the fundamental engineering and technology works. So hopefully with this event, and of course with the very brief introduction and limited time that I have, I like to invite you all to collaborate, to build collaborative bridges, and hope that we can come to that time when there won't be no need for too many protocols to collaborate and that we can just build technology that is helping and improving life of every child on this planet or everybody on this planet. We cannot say, you know, 
is there one place that is ideal place on the planet? But all we could say, we have a planet, Earth, and that is an ideal place to live. So, with this, I like to say thank you, Professor Kuzmin. Thank you, organizing committee. Thank you, everyone who participated in this event. And I wish you all a very productive, very fruitful discussions. And of course, establishments of very, very successful collaborative bridges all across the planet. Of course, given the fact that this event is held in wonderful Uralia, Yachachuskazat Bolshia Spasiba, La Priglashenia, Mne Ochen Priatno, I Ochen Blagodarni, Stoyam Mogu Pazdravit Vas, I Pasavetovat Vam Dobrie. Zdrowie, Sevo Haraševo. I nadejem se, što pridjot lučije dni, kada mi budem moć srećića i podat ruku čeloveku i rabotat mešte, što bi naše djeti, vaše djeti, djeti i vseh djeti imeli lučiju žizem na meni, meni, mnoga, mnoga djeti. Spasiba e da svidanja. Once again, thank you and uh, I look forward to your communication. Please feel free to send me an email or ask Professor Kuzmin. He will be a, point, a contact point. And I hope that we can somehow establish a forum or we can build on this particular event and continue to collaborate and continue perhaps having different panels, different workshops, different sessions. When we will addre be addressing issues that are perhaps more technical or issues that are in the dimensions of application or even impact of how technology is impacting human lives and the life we live today. Apart from Russian and English, I would like to say merci beaucoup. Je vous souhaite a magnifique conference. Et voilà, j'espère que nous avons l'opportunité de collaborer ensemble. I also hope very much that when time comes, you will be able to visit um, institutions all across the planet, that the travel will come to normal that we will overcome COVID, that humanity will overcome COVID, and that technology will be truly smart and yet also truly ethical, serving people, serving everyone, to make sure that life of all of us, of all of people on the planet is much better. Thank you and wishing you good health and all the best. Thank you. Hello, good, good morning. I'm, I am Alberto Cerezo Narvaez from the University of Cadiz. I am going to talk to you about the project management competencies for next engineers in the Industry 4 era, the case study. Well, um, what is the problem to be solved? The problem to be solved is that in the Industry 4, there is an increasing gap between competencies that labor market expects, labor market needs, and what new employees own, new employees offer. There is a gap, an increasing gap, and must be solved. How to reverse this problem? We have to answer two questions. The first one, how to train future highly creative, innovative, and entrepreneurial scientific or technological professionals? How to train? these future professionals? Uh, what is the role of universities in relation to technology and relation to society in, in this context? Well, um, educational policies in Europe, including Spain, especially after the implementation of the European Higher Education Area, following the Bologna Declaration, have among their objectives that the university must promote creative, 
innovative and entrepreneur attitudes. This requires both a double change, a cultural change, social acceptance of the role of private companies in society, the first challenge, and the second challenge, the increase in the skills and abilities of the future entrepreneurs. Well, the context of our research, I belong to the University of Cadiz, which is in the south of Andalusia, which is in the south of Spain, which is in the south of Europe, the south of the south of the south. Well, in the, in the Bay of Cadiz, we have two leading companies, Navantia in the naval sector, and Airbus in the, in the aerospace sector, and I belong to the engineering school, and we are very next to, to these leading global leading companies. Well, the objectives of our research are four objectives. To analyze the current situation in order to detect the deficiencies and needs of the Spanish entrepreneurial ecosystem. To promote a debate on the specific Andalusian ecosystem in which leading companies coexist with a high unemployment. To identify initiatives and actions to encourage and improve creativity, innovation, and entrepreneurship. And finally, to undertake the best practices that develop competencies to promote entrepreneurship, innovation, and creativity. Uh, we are, we may do in four phases. The first of one, uh, the encouragement of education in entrepreneurship. The second one, training for the creation of innovation companies. The third, promotion of the culture of innovative entrepreneurship. And the fourth phase, the selection of innovative project proposals. Well, the P project began four years ago in all the engineering degrees of our university of the industrial branch, chemistry, design and product development, electricity, electronics, mechanics, and technology. In the fifth year, next year, next academic year, we are going to implement in, in the rest of engineering degrees of our university. Well, um, to prepare the framework, on the one hand, we must to, 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 to take into account the competence to be acquired, learning and training activities, and the assessment of our future engineers, of our students. This is a this is the, the last subject of the degree. Um, we have to, to, to check if they are prepared for the professional career. Well, and we do thanks to a theoretical test and a practical case. The practical case is an entrepreneurship project based on a technology, organizational, or marketing innovation. This framework has to compare competencies from the European context and dimensions of the European accredited engineer level, the EURES, and check with the Spanish context, the white papers of the ANECA and the engineering memory degrees of our university. If we check those competences with the competence promoted by the most important project management association all around the world, the International Project Management Association and the Project Management Institute, in this mix, we find the training competences, which are going to be checked in the practical case. Here, we can see, we can see the stressed competence has have been developed from the tuning project from the dimensions of the level, of the erase level, which are, which have been taken into account, and the professional competence from in, in project management from the IPNA and PNI. Well, finally, all this uh, framework, this approach, is synthesized in 16 competencies which are classified into basic competencies, general competencies, common specific competencies, 
specific competencies to the industrial branch and transversal competencies. These 16 competencies are, as, are evaluated according to nine evaluation criteria. Case study defense, entrepreneurship and innovation, selection of potential technologies to be applied, business organization, project management, technical definition of the project, self-management, how students have managed their own projects, problem solving, creative project solving, and knowledge. Well, after uh, four academic years, we have developed 80 proposals related to energy production and storage devices, augmented and virtual reality devices, software and hardware applications, well-being services, safety devices, security and cyber security devices, household mechatronic devices, and professional mechatronic devices. These uh, 80 proposals has, have been presented to a championship promoted by our university, which is the Atrevete competition, which is a, a free competition that highlights potential entrepreneurs, that creates technology-based companies, and transfer research results to the context of Cadiz and Andalusia and Spain. Well, um, in, in the four academic years, we we check, we measure the at the beginning of the course and at the end of the course the the utility, the the importance, the interest, and knowledge that project management in a technological context suppose for them. In this graphic, we can see the evolution regarding the the beginning and the at the end of the of the courses of the four courses. In addition, here we can see the, the, the qualification of our students, the, the results according to the, to the, to the nine criteria. The, the first eight criteria, some 80%, uh, and the last one, knowledge, 20%. Well, here in this graphic, we can see how uh, we compare the self evolution in 71 points to the knowledge, to the real, to the current uh, and real uh, knowledge acquired, 67 percent, and the and the and the compare between the the self evolution 71 with the 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 global assessment 70. We can see that they are very 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 close. So our assessment criteria have, have, are aligned with they think about the, their own evolution. Well, to conclude, we can we can we can hold that the evaluation by competencies allows to align engineering degree memories of the industrial branch of our university with the planning project of the European Higher Education Area and with the most important professional standards in project management. The chosen topics allow students to face the challenges that uh, the paradigm of the industry four provides them. Value proposition to make the world a better place for life and, um, and work. The selection of the proper technology to be applied in their projects. And the business organization, management, and technical definition of the project. To find out, the experience offers students an holistic approach to better understand the relation between technology and society through entrepreneurship, creativity, and innovation. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you. Uh, colleagues, do you have any questions? I have a question. 
do you set the task to build uh, competencies for industry 5.0? Industry five, industry four. Industry 5.0. Uh, do you uh, set tasks for yourselves uh, to help students uh, build competences for industry 5.0? No, uh, thank you for the question. Well, this is the subject of project management. It's the, the um, and engineering projects is the, non, is, is the name of the subject. And we have to take into account technological uh, and sustainability questions. Well, uh, we have to train how they are going to create value to 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 make profitable and, and feasible and, and viable the initiatives they take into account. They have to make the project canvas. They have to to make the list of requirements, the declaration of the scope, the work regular cluster, the list of activities. They they must. To, to estimate the duration of activities, the, to make the shovel, to, to apply resources, to make the budget, uh, to analyze risks, threats, and opportunities. So uh, they, are, um, they come from a lot of uh, technical uh, subjects. So it's very difficult for them to, to, to shame the ship. So, how to do it? We we do making the they propose the 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 thing to be to be whole. Um, uh, they are uh, technology lovers. They are young people, and they they uh, they know a lot of technologies, and 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 this implies uh, to 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 to. To get a better approach to to this context, because um, the the rest of the science are not very 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 aligned with uh, future technologies. They are they are uh, crossing between the twenty the twenty century and the twenty first. So we have to try to they they know technologies which are all around the world but the industry five is very very far for us still so uh, the four uh, we, we, we are with five uh, five or eight years of, of delay you know so in, at the moment industry four and, and <laughs> I understand. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, dear colleagues. Are there any more questions? Uh, no questions. Uh, there are no questions. Uh, thank you, dear professor, for a very interesting keynote. And among our participants, there are many universities. Uh, so I think it is interesting for them to learn about this experience. Thank you very much. And next, I would like to give floor so, Professor uh, Francisco Denis, uh, um, okay. Portugal Industry, uh, uh, Trad, UTAD, Villa Real, Portugal, uh, the keynote, Industry 4.0, uh, in individual perceptions about its nine technologies. Professor, you have the floor. Thank you. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you and see you okay. well. Okay, so I'm waiting for my um, for, for my PowerPoint presentation. And um, first of all, I want to th um, thank you for the invitation. And um, I am keen to participate in such a, an important conference and an international one. So, um, do you have my PowerPoint presentation? Unfortunately, no, we don't see the slides yet. Oh. 
I cannot meet you. I send to you. I don't, I cannot see it here. Do, don't you have there my, my PowerPoint presentation? Почему-то я у себя не вижу, то есть нет, да, у вас слайдов. We'll try to ask our IT guy to yeah, no, maybe please. consult. Please. So, uh, before you have my, my PowerPoint presentation with the helpers, I, no, I, 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 I I'd like to say that. Uh, so what you need to do is demonstrate the screen, uh, share the screen. It's a button at the bottom. It's green, a green yes. button at the bottom. Share the screen. Yes. So oh, yes, you, it's here. Okay. You, you will see your desktop and you need to okay. choose the, okay. the presentation. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Because it is in the last slide, so I didn't recognize it. <laughs> okay, that's it. So we are speaking about individual perceptions. Um, let me. Yeah. Um, so we 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 start for. Um, uh, for saying that th this is a joint project between, as I will tell you later on, between Portugal, uh, Poland and Latvia. So we are uh, willing to, to research for individual perceptions about te uh, its technologies, Industry uh, 4.0. Um, this is a, a, also a joint research uh, for me, from me and from my colleagues from the Instituto de Felgueiras. So we are, uh, first of all, the contest. We have here the, the, the recent evolution. We have the first uh, mechanical and waving, the first industrial revolution through mechanical production facilities, namely water and uh, steam power. In the late 70s, then the 80, uh, the, in the 80s, late 80s, we have electronic, um, electrical energy that uh, allow us to have mass production. Then we, we have in the mid of uh, the 20th century, uh, we have um, uh, we have through the applications of IT to further um, ultimate, and then we we are in now um, the, the facing the, the the meeting real and and virtual worlds. Um, we are we are. Uh, the research community has experienced different approaches, concepts, and sometimes it gives some confusing. But the key issues are, are human resources fully committed to these new technologies? How open are human beings to accept, um, welcome and adapt the, this, new, this new environment? And that, therefore, we are uh, dealing with the, with the key question, how familiar are different groups of people with um, 4.0 uh, and its technologies? And the technologies are, uh, as you know, simulation, internet on things, big data and, and analytics, um, cloud, um, cyber security, horizontal and, and, and vertical integration, robotics, augmented reality, additive manufacturing. Um, we, uh, we are, um, 
we are facing uh, challenges in the organization on work, new technologies, new technologies need uh, to rethink organization. Uh, the external environment should also um, uh, adopt uh, new technologies uh, are dependent on their uh, implemented, all, all they are uh, where they are implemented. And, and basically, basically, new technologies require new competences, skills from labor. Uh, so the questions of the of our research is, is there any difference towards I for zero technologies according to gender, according to generating factor, and according to education and field of studies? Uh, as I told you, this is a border project, a uh, multicultural team, Portugal, Poland, and Latvia. Uh, we are in the, the very beginning of the project. We have uh, data from uh, 260 individuals um, uh, using um, social network. Uh, we want to study if there are if they are independent, if the variables are independent, or uh, if they are dependent, or whether they do not exist, uh, exists um, uh, variable association or exists uh, uh, association. Uh, we use as methodology as uh, statistics the chi square uh, analysis, and we take decision about the p value. And uh, our research is this is from this year, uh, March to July uh, 2020. So we the hypotheses uh, are sort of confusion here, but I will like uh, to tell you only that if there are any variable association between gender, generation, level of education, field of studies, and knowledge. And then to all the the to all the the, the new technologies. So the results are as follows. We we have here the new technology or the technologies, and we can see that um, uh, cloud is uh, as the highest level uh, of mean. Uh, uh, we are speaking about between zero and five. So 3.71, it's, uh, it's the highest, and uh, Internet on Things. Then we have, uh, we, we have the variables, gender, male and female, uh, generation, baby boomer uh, from the immediately uh, after the Second World War, then gener uh, generation X, uh, 70, uh, 60s and 70s, generation Y, uh, 70s, 80s, and gener uh, Generation Z from 90s on. Uh, we have education, basic school, high school, university degrees, master or doctorate, missing. We have also the field of education, economics, management, social science and law, tourism, science, technology, engineering and mathematics, um, uh, health uh, and others. Um, the results suggest that the, in what regards the I4.0, uh, uh, there are no difference between genders. The generation result is without statistical validity. Looking at the results, we are not uh, 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 facing um, uh, unexpected patterns. The same. Uh, is with education result without statistical validation and the field of studies, no statistical difference identified uh, on the categories economics and, man and, and management. The number of, uh, of um, individuals with lower levels of uh, I.0 is I than expected. And the opposite is um, uh, scenario uh, was identified in, in um, the, the field of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. 
you have here the the all the the hypotheses uh, rejected or not rejected and as conclusions we uh, we uh, assume that the familiarization with the uh, is not a particular characteristic of specific group um there are no significant different dif di differences between the uh, among the level of education uh, uh, field of studies uh, towards this new technology on gender there there we can verify that men are more um, comfortable with the big data analysis than women uh, it is also identified that younger generation y and z are more um, on the following technologies um, augmented reality simulation and um, vertical and horizontal uh, vertical horizontal integration what is uh, important also to point out is is that digital transformation society uh, uh, of the society industry and services uh, as well as education field are in the development transforming process, which means that uh, there, that are some of these previous results could be vary through uh, time. Um, and the, 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 this is, I want to point out that for us it was the first first draft of um, attempt to have to have some data from it. So we are uh improving the, the 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 size of the sample so we can have more accurate uh, results thank you for your information uh, and i will begin to answer to questions if you have so once again uh, thank you for letting me presenting uh, in the uh, in the conference Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor. Uh, colleagues, are there any questions regarding this interesting study? Could you tell me, Professor, I have this question. As a, a significant variable, a significant fa factor, did you analyze the place of residence of your correspondents, whether they live in Western or Eastern Europe, in Asia or America or other co uh, continents? Uh, thank you for the interesting question. This is our aim: is to see how the, the to study the difference between uh, or among Portugal, Poland, and Latvia. So we have, and also to to make some cross uh, sessions, so we can have Poland and Latvia as eastern countries, and Portugal as a very uh, west uh, west country, and also to compare the if the levels of development of the of the countries plays uh, um, uh, plays a role in the perceptions of these new technologies uh, that's that's the aim of the final project as i told you we are uh, starting this year uh, so this is the first attempt to present um, uh, results or preliminary uh, results in an international forum. Uh, thank you. So we'll be looking forward to uh, future uh, your future results and your thank articles you. in our magazine. Uh, so yes. to get more details. Thank you very much. Okay. Alex, are there any more questions? Yes, General uh, Limer, please. Dear Professor, it's been very interesting to listen to your keynote. Uh, because uh, it provokes a lot of thought <laughs> and I would really love to see a continuation of your study. In this sphere, I have this question. The results of the study, uh, theoretically, what they show, they show that countries with high uh, level of birth, where a lot of babies are born, uh, Generation Z and uh, today's uh, Generation Alpha. So theoretically, these countries should be ahead of developed countries with low birth rate uh, so they should be ahead of those countries in technological development do you think these countries with a lot of babies born 
they will be heard of developed countries or still uh, we will see a simple overflow of capital and this overflow of capital will result uh, the situation when developed countries will take over the young and technologically uh, developed minds <laughs> so what do you think uh, this is a very important and, and interesting question uh, I, I i think that for for instance in in portugal um we are facing problems in the birth rate so we we have we have uh, the fatality of our women um it's about 1.3 and we need 2.1 to uh, guarantee the 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 renovation of generations so we see uh, that we are getting older and older uh, and as you know old people are not keen of new technology so it it is a challenge to provide young people with these sort of uh, abilities in the education level to guarantee that these technologies uh, will have uh, an opportunity in our countries in the future. We cannot count on the, the old people to do, do, to do this. That's why uh, birth rate is a key issue and uh, countries that have uh, young people are more um, can use and can provide um, uh, more ability to uh, to use these new technologies and so to augment their uh, to improve their um, productivity and their well-being for the for the countries this is a, a, like a snowball uh in the in the right direction or in the wrong direction so this is very very interesting to see uh and uh, formally uh, in the uh, the late 20s we are uh, very keen to don't have babies in our country uh, in our countries now we see that uh, perhaps this will this was uh, not a very good as a very good strategy towards these new challenges that we we we, we have but we can do that with um, uh, with uh, the revolution in the educational process uh, my question is will our teachers be prepared to accept these um, uh, these new challenges this is also another another question because the professors are all are, are also old people <laughs> in 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 a way so let's see let's see thank you very much for your question uh, thank you very much uh, colleagues are there any more questions to professor dennis dennis uh, no more questions thank you and so, I would like spasiba, spasiba, I would like spasiba. to invite Ala Vladova. She was among the participants. Is she is she here? Uh, she was asking a question about the connection. So uh, hello, I'm here. Yes, uh, I uh, uh, she was there and she was trying to establish how to connect up. So Alexey Tepushin. Uh, I asked him, uh, you were testing your presentation. Can you not hear me? Allah is... Uh, okay, uh, the floor is uh, given to Allah then. Well, I've got to share screen and then I have to turn on... Uh, you can remain in the Russian channel or um, common channel if you don't want to hear the translation. should be... Right, share screen. Yeah, we can see your presentation, but uh, I have to press uh, a Russian channel. I have to turn over the. It's just uh, the listeners will be able to pick the channel. It doesn't really matter. So, 
Well, I first of all wanted to thank uh, the organizers of the conference because this uh, is uh, my first experience uh, of uh, working at the conference in Yekaterinburg. I'm well impressed of the organization, with the organization uh, of uh, uh, the review. It was a number of uh, messages per day I was getting from the editors. Uh, I submitted a number of uh, articles and uh, this was uh, quite an intensive work it was really charged so thank you and uh, secondly i uh, to the maximum i wanted to uh, get my specifics uh, of the conference uh, uh, to the specifics of the conference so if you don't understand some technological issues i can answer right uh, during the uh, uh, lecture so it, it doesn't have to be a monologue it could be dialogue you can ask questions straight away and so what i want to tell you about today is uh, every time every time like uh, this is the project is a real project which is ongoing on the analysis and monitoring of uh, the conditions uh, of uh, temperature and um, eco uh, along the uh, pipeline the soils the soil uh, and every time when i open a statistics book especially uh, a book from abroad uh, they mention that there is uh, in methodology there is a storytelling so storytelling what's a storytelling then from english that is uh, can be translated as uh, in Russian, uh, this is in the statistical books, it's uh, data interpretation, really. So I wanted to uh, build my keynote as uh, storytelling about this project. Maybe I will be able to do that. And uh, what are we going to be talking about? These are the very kind of severe, heavy uh, conditions of uh, 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 maintenance and operation uh, be beyond the the polar circle in the polar uh, around the polar circle and so this is this is the pipeline is uh, somewhere here so this is the polar circle so this is siberia this is uh, this is this is north siberia just here and we are somewhere here this is where we are at the moment this is the urals we're here somewhere so what is uh, the region characterized by the very difficult uh, very difficult uh, very uh, soil so you can see the permafrost here and in this situation when you have a pipeline there in the ground uh, it is uh, the oil is warm and that thaws the ground so if it's a, if it's a big pipeline so it's high pressure high temperature because it's high viscosity of the oil being produced so it is it warms up uh, the ground so of course the permafrost thaws and if it thaws i didn't give you the example of uh, the uh, pipeline this is just a house you see it's not a pipeline so and then you see the uh, where the pipe uh, could be and that will lead to a, a breakdown so the unique data that we have um, before the construction of the pipeline, there was uh, it was examined the 500 kilometers and um, uh, wells have been drilled to establish the layers of uh, the actual ground of the of uh, and. Uh, and the design documentation was developed then and this is the unique data on temperatures of uh, the ground and how is that obtained uh, so these are the thermal wells it's every hundred meters along the pipeline there is a thermal well and there are these uh, sensors temperature sensors uh, low down so every meter or half a meter down to 12 18 meters the temperature is measures every minute and then the data is sent to the central server and what is the problem the problem is is there 
is there thawing or is there is no thawing? Is there ice melting or no ice melting? So this is seasonality. Of course, there is a signal uh, effect. So there is the econometric models uh, where you can uh, look at the trends, at the seasonality of occurrences, and with uh, with the help of uh, the integration of uh, uh, process uh, and uh, temperature data to uh, to see whether there is thawing of the permafrost or not. So we can actually prognosticate the temperature. We can predict it using this, an analyzing the literature using uh, the uh, dimensions platform. And uh, now, at the moment, uh, I read in the news that uh, this uh, uh, link that came from my university, financial university with the government of the Russian Federation. Uh, they sent me the link and I know that uh, the majority of colleges uh, of higher education uh, in establishments in Russia, they are connected up to the platform free of charge. So it gives this access uh, to uh, paid for resources that you have to pay for, uh, global resources on paid patents, on publications, even on uh, some uh, data, certain data. And they had a look at uh, uh, publications on cryogeology. Uh, you all know very well that uh, there was a serious uh, breakdown in Norilsk. Uh, there was a serious disaster uh, a few numbers uh, months ago, a couple of months ago. Uh, that was uh, to do with the thawing of the ground, with warming up, uh, with the huge economic uh, losses and political. Um, uh, resonance and so there was a quite a high number of publications now it is growing the importance of these subjects is on the up and up and unfortunately unfortunately siberia has uh, been impacted by the greenhouse uh, gas effect uh, greenhouse effect more than any other region in the world because the temperatures uh, relative to the average global have gone up uh, at twofold and since russia is uh, the leading country with the country with the uh, most of the construction most of the buildings in the firm from so it's gonna impact uh it's gonna affect us directly uh, the software that we used in this project uh, that is uh, stack python uh, various libraries uh, uh, Python libraries for big data analysis and uh, I also as a tutor I've got a subscription so the for to uh, Tableau it's a uh, tableau it's called the body tableau I prefer the French uh, options and uh, machine learning uh, uh, SK learn without neural networks uh, so just the simplest thing in order to uh, to, to analyze it, to have the answer. What was the method of the statistical analysis? Uh, there were three stages here. Uh, the collection processing of, pro, of uh, primary data, uh, grouping the data and hypotheses and a result interpretation, which is a storytelling of that is uh, the thing here. And a couple of uh, steps here I wanted to uh, talk about this method and uh, the first thing uh, that uh, we needed to do this is a uh, geology has to be connected to the temperature there are various files with different uh, with various uh, contractors different wells and we had to approximate the data and about 10 years ago and even more I uh, there was the, I did my doctoral thesis and there was a candidate thesis uh, that was on the vibe there uh, on the stages of uh, uh, the data scientist the stages of work of a data scientist it's not that complex so one of the goals was uh, one of the tasks was resolved the machine learning the attempt to find to establish patterns um, some similarities when with the uh, to fill out the missing data. The correlation for the types of the ground that we had, uh, uh, there are the main types of ground, uh, and you can see here the basic type is sand, and also there is this distribution has been built. Uh, this is uh, this looks very much like binomial. Uh, 
hard ground is uh, lacking very much granite and gravel uh, which is uh, which corresponds to the physical picture of uh, this is the marshland uh, loam uh, uh, clay and uh, sand and a lot of ice so frozen so very very difficult there's a lot of water content in uh, uh, this uh, soil in this ground and what was very interesting here there, there was this observation um, which would be the subject of our further research. Uh, the uh, thickness of the stratum, of the layer of every uh, type uh, of the ground in, de in terms of depth, and uh, these uh, thicknesses, uh, they are distributed exponentially, which means that, first of all, we can model, and secondly, we are dealing here with the top of well quite a low value is that this is a pie of uh, thin layers uh, this kind of a, a, an interlayered cake of quite a complex uh, uh, soils here and what was very interesting and demonstrative uh, picture uh, there was semantic analysis of the initial uh, base uh, the baseline uh, that uh, confirmed our uh, guess that it's sand and we have uh, frozen uh, ground of different sorts uh, uh, saturated with water very uh, seriously so it's quite easily it's a word cloud so this is a library and uh, this is uh, really quickly uh, for a researcher is uh, not very difficult and on the next stage uh, we understood that uh, uh, not mm, too many uh, uh, indicators here so we had to more to add more data to model to, to be able to model on the basis of that data how to add more data so we have the description of the so of the ground we have the depth of every layer and then we look at uh, classifier of uh, grounds and every ground from that classifier is given uh, a digit a, a figure uh, some figure not just some figure but uh, this universal classifier uh, universal classification uh, uh, tool and then we calculated uh, for every point these uh, layers the sum total of uh, these uh, figures and then we uh, divided it by the top uh, depth. And so there is this gradient that we could calculate at every point in order to be able to compare our different grounds. And then we uh, put it into the database. So we acquired, like this, we acquired an additional indicator and then uh, the basic types of ground, uh, they were delineated. The depth of uh, investigation was uh, uh, shown here. This is the basic type. Uh, so this is the organic loam, uh, sandy loam, and uh, this kind of thing. And this is their clustering. So they see, you see the purple um, kind of clusters here, green clusters there. And it's of great interest to us because um, the grounds, uh, they impact on the temperature very much. Uh, the, tem the thermal conductivity of the ground may be one of uh, the indicators for our, for our database. And then we had an attempt, the first attempt, to build a model. Uh, so this is a simple regression model of the kilometers. Uh, this is the sum total uh, divided by the gradient. Uh, uh, so gradient divided by the depth of uh, uh, exploration and the function here uh, the function the temperature is a function of this so, so we build it along the line and there and the distribution of these temperatures uh, were looked at depending on the kilometer and uh, these temperatures and then we, what we've seen here we've seen uh, the top uh, the top uh, a curve which is the day temperature on the surface of uh, uh, the ground uh, and then the seasonality we can see of course the seasonality of the actual or the environmental uh, of the air uh, that impacts seriously and this is the average temperature curve at the depth of 10 meters and at the depth of 10, 10 meters we can see still that even at 10 meters on average we can see 
that the ground thaws, uh, warms up. So at some points, they're of great interest to us. So the picture is not that bad, but we have to take it into account. We have unique data in that this data was obtained before the pipe was uh, put in, in or, or before the pipe was commissioned, the put in operation. So what ha what's going to happen when uh, the actual pipe is going to be commissioned and the situation has to improve, uh, doesn't it? So we understand that here. First of all, there is a lot of uh, gray, uh, gray uh, uh, rectangles here. And we understand, we understand that there is a certain lack of data. And Einstein, I think, he said that uh, if you, you try to again and again we use the same method uh, resolve some task then and then for a hundred time it is not going to be resolved then you have to add something into the end what could statistician add statistician could add some data and this is uh, so we decided we just we decided that we cannot explain these uh, uh, points of warming up, we can see sandy loam, sandy loam, and like and temperature, the average uh, annual temperature is, uh, it seems uh, that below zero, and here we have the temperature above zero, so we can't explain it, so what we need, we need more data, what kind of data do we need, we can get the data from open sources, for instance. So this is the quote, actually. The problems we face cannot be solved at the same level of thinking right when we created them. Uh, that, uh, so this is uh, the uh, quote that I want to hear. So the Zoom services, they get in the way here a little bit. So how to enrich the data before the startup? We, we uh, drill the well every 100 meters along the pipeline where at uh, different uh, depths we measure temperature. We attempted to uh, have a look at the ex uh, thermal exposure. Uh, the east side, south side, west side, well, how uh, the light is, uh, how they are lit uh, by the sun, so how the environment impacts on that, how to establish the impact, the environmental impact. So then uh, the actual, uh, above sea level, the altitude uh, was measured also, and uh, there were uh, the guidebooks where you can see the uh, thermal conductivity of the ground. So this is big data. This is what we're talking about. We had to resort to quite a lengthy process of data processing preparation. Uh, after the, uh, the pipeline was started, so there are three uh, thermal uh, wells, the distance, the points of um, oil, warming station, heating station, and how they work. So get, there are the points where the oil is heated along the pipeline, so it doesn't get too cold, and what temperature do they actually uh, have on the output, where they are located. That may impact uh, our, so this is how we enriched our data. So I've got only a couple of slides left. And um, uh, clusterization, clusters of the pieces of the pipeline. So what's very interesting here, is the task that we managed to resolve. The, and uh, I started uh, using this approach quite frequently now. Uh, we, since we have uh, big data, we reduce the size of the data through clusterization. Uh, clustering, we found those thermal wells, those grounds uh, where uh, which behave in a similar fashion. And it turns out that three, four clusters is enough. And then inside the cluster, then we, so this is, this endless task is driven down to three, four clusters. When inside the cluster, what we do the uh, prediction of uh, the temperatures. And then there was an additional uh, indicators were introduced, uh, ingredients, uh, for example, the temperature near surface down to at five meters, for example. Uh, for example, the pipeline is somewhere here and the, the big depth uh, temperature. So there's a couple of gradients. Uh, this is the relationship between the temperatures and uh, depth of the thermometer uh, being set. And with the help of these gradients, we added uh, to the database in order to 
and be able to improve the precision of our model. And then inside, inside each cluster, we were mod we modeled and predicted the temperatures, taking into account quite uh, non econometric or halter winters problem uh, models, for instance, that uh, uh, take into account trends and seasonality. So this is the ideal end result. So of course, uh, it would have been all to automate the process, that would have been a good result, but fully automated, we couldn't do it because the, there are changes ongoing. We have to have additional work, but you can automate it a little bit. And um, in order to automate it, we have developed a quite large database. So not only this data, but also the plans. And so uh, quite a, a large uh, a body of work was done and we've uh, gathered uh, the first release uh, with certain results and um, the project has been published. There is a patent a patent here, and uh, there are certain so there are the potential problematic pieces of the pipeline. So that probably would require additional measures, probably uh, additional insulation of the actual pipeline, heat insulation, might be the change of the of the positioning. Probably put it, probably get it up higher, or um, have. Uh, um, monitoring more frequent, uh, uh, have it more frequent. And this is what I wanted to say about the specifics of uh, the original specifics of uh, laying down a pipeline in the polar region. So I'm so sorry if it is too technical for you. Well, thank you very much. It was a very interesting uh, high tech for our uh, listeners, but today we are discussing big data and the big data. The question is, is of uh, who is uh, who orders this? Who orders these algorithms? Are they private companies or is it governmental uh, uh, procurement? Or who who orders this data? Who uh, invests into gathering this data and uh, processing? So I didn't show you the last slide. Thank you very much um, for this uh, question. And um, so this was the uh, Transneft was the uh, customer. And now I have the project. I keep looking for people for this project. Assessment of the technical condition of uh, the sites. It will be similar because this also will be the pipeline uh, sites, uh, a very very long kind of uh, pipeline, and uh, with grounds, with temperatures, etc., with all the interesting uh, uh, properties here. Those. This is the project. It's quite a, a serious. So, Gazprom uh, production in uh, the prognosis of uh, corrosion defects developing, uh, you know, so this is oil, oil industry, are uh, the clients. So private companies, private companies are interested. So they would finance, uh, what about private companies? Would they fund this kind of, uh, well, Transneft is, uh, is the largest in the world operator. Uh, transports uh, oil is a company that has uh, a government state-owned capital uh, so mainly it's gazprom neft sibur so these uh, main, main, mainly the companies that do have data so the, their problem is uh, uh, they used to you get uh, 10 pieces of data you know the classic statistics classical statistics uh, how well it behaves. You have 10 points and you have to, uh, out of these 10 points, you can, you have to extrapolate uh, this from 10 points uh, you, to 100 points. You, and now the situation is diametrically opposite. Uh, there is a huge amount of data. For example, the Russian railways, uh, they don't even store the data because they, they cannot, they don't have enough storage space to store the data. They process the data f for a week and then they, some organizational data after processing they do keep and uh, all the raw data they just uh, discard they, they destroy because they have no resource for data storage so this the the task is now is the diametrically opposite they don't have time for processing this is why they need the big data digitization mm, uh, this is why they need the new methods new brains so that people so that people so that the, 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 so that they could the process is result because uh, um, unfortunately most often people calculate averages you know like uh, average temperature in the hospital uh, amongst the patients you know that kind of thing uh, uh, outdated 
And so thank you very much. And I do hope for the further cooperation. So colleagues, uh, now I want to give uh, the stage to Alexei Tipuhin. Alexei Tipuhin, please. Uh, uh, what about a question? Uh, yes, you can ask Ali. Uh, uh, so there are questions, uh, to, uh, questions, a lot of questions. I understand that I can't uh, ask them all, but uh, just three questions I'd like to ask. And uh, the end result, the end result, uh, how can it be used and by whom? Uh, uh, not just uh, the name of the company, but who will be the specialist uh, using it? What, what would they be doing it with the data? Uh, what kind of professional would be using it? And uh, that's an excellent question. Thank you very much. Uh, in these companies, uh, there are uh, services like the monitoring uh, uh, service or monitoring department, department and it's an old uh, task um, to build uh, uh, technical monitoring uh, maintenance plans, for instance. I do know this very well, so without the details, the question is in, uh, in that, uh, that uh, all oil pipelines in the Arctic and uh, uh, in uh, uh, frozen grounds, they have to be above ground, above ground. And if they are above ground, uh, then the pipeline will not be warming anything up, would it? Uh, uh, because it is above the ground, and that's it. That's the answer. So only uh, thawing is happening where the supports are in the ground. So the question is, there's no corrosion. Well, we are not talking about corrosion here. You were saying that corrosion, that was a different project. And the key question here, uh, that would be uh, these uh, uh, pylons being pushed out. So in the summer, they'll sink into the ground. In the winter, they will be pushed out by the frost, uh, pushed up. So the first thing, what you have to know is you have to know the specifics. You have to be very clear of the layers, uh, the information on the layers of the ground where you have the supports and only the supports. And then you have to work on, I'm so sorry. And uh, then uh, the uh, techniques, they have to work on the pipeline when uh, this pipe is uh, moving up and down. And so this was the question. And uh, so I thought I thought it was uh, for some other uh, so for pipelines I don't know how to this data could be used uh, practically because uh, I uh, represent represent a rural uh, uh, branch of the Academy of Sciences so the resource of uh, large systems I understand uh, the pipelines and machines and uh, we do work on uh, uh, the uh, reliability the life cycle the life expectancy of uh, uh, permafrost ground. So I just want, I want to make friends. You probably know my supervisor, Kushnarenka, of my uh, doctoral and my candidate. So of course I do know him because I am from the Urals and beyond bound, you, you know him here. So I could tell you here that first of all, uh, there's a, uh, of course, there is this underwater crossing and the underground uh, sections here on this, uh, this pipeline. Secondly, uh, the project documentation, actually, the design uh, states uh, that uh, the measures for the insulation and uh, for the specific uh, ground filling of, of, the, of the ditch uh, that treating the ground that uh, it may not uh, result in the complete insulation and it would still be uh, ground heating. And you understand the actual uh, performance of work in this region, it changes. It changes the geology and it uh, helps the change of uh, uh, the con uh, thermal conductivity of the grounds and um, there is a constant uh, 
work is happening on installation, on monitoring, on repair, and that impacts uh, the change in terms of, of uh, the pylons being pushed out. I think that's probably the most important, uh, but it is not the, own, the only task. It's important one. It's an important one, but uh, and there, of course, uh, it is quite well known. So it's the deformation uh, marks, there are certain workarounds uh, uh, for, uh, in these situations, but what uh, would we want to have, because they're very uh, difficult to access these regions, and um, in the summer it's uh, not possible to access at all, so I wanted to uh, help people to uh, class, to cluster these uh, uh, hazardous areas, and the situation of uh, uh, freezing the uh, supports out, and for me, is as a data processing person, this is just an additional, an additional uh, um, variable that I put into the database. That's all it is when I get the data. And here, here is something uh, that we could uh, discuss uh, on the topic. I think, but the most important um, problem is this is the warming up of the grounds um, thawing through the due to the global warming, and in the world, all over the world, it happens. And we have there are special uh, testing grounds. Maybe you don't know about them. Special testing grounds. So there are the pieces of uh, tundra where. Uh, there is a place about five meters, uh, uh, there are wells drilled, and uh, uh, there is the, uh, there is not, it's not a line, but the field of temperatures is studies, and that has been going on 18, 20, maybe more years, it's been going on, and these fields, these fields, you can build, uh, you can build uh, uh, random functions and f random fields of how it all uh, breathes and moves and with particular layers, uh, with a particular... Con um, so there's no mix, there is no average and none of that. Particular layers, the strata, and this data can be used for the mechanics, uh, for the reliability, stability, as uh, how the corrosion impacts, uh, uh, corrosion destruction impacts on the entire thing together with uh, seasonal uh, 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 supports being pushed out and, and sinking and subsidence. And uh, so these results would have been even better if you took into account uh, those uh, figures. So I'm so sorry, I think Victoria, uh, we are out of time, out of time here, I'm so sorry. We have one, we have more speakers who want to talk. So, colleagues, thank you very much. Uh, I give the stage to uh, Alexei Tipuhin. And his keynote uh, digitization of uh, uh, supply chain. Alexei, please. Uh, dear colleagues, hello. I'll try to start the presentation. Digitalization of supply chain management objects. And maybe you can open the presentation and then uh, open. Uh, uh, this is, I cannot open it. It's got to be on your desktop, and then you can open. Alexei, if uh, 
And so you open it at the uh, desktop and then and then you share it and you start it. Uh, maybe you send it to my uh, uh, mail and then we'll start with a different uh, probably the different speaker. So yeah, it's all it's all working. Yeah. So you have to open the presentation itself. So I think it's open now. We can only see your uh, file manager. It's open. Yeah, yeah, it is open now. So let's start. Uh, thank you very much, dear colleagues. Uh, so it's a great pleasure for me to take part because even a plenary, plenary meeting, it was uh, definitely my interest. Uh, so this is the logistics and um, interaction. It's very important of the subject in uh, digitization and logistics. Uh, uh, gets rid of itself the typical logistical operation transporting and uh, a storage and uh, a very similar one option is when you are going to pay uh, for your rates uh, for example and today you use uh, just a smartphone that uh, you uh, so the digitization gets rid of um, uh, so we always transport somewhere, we uh, keep ourselves in some rooms in front of some doors so this is one of the aspects that I wanted to stress. So why I take part into this uh, uh, conference. So it's very good that uh, before me uh, there was the uh, tools that we were using, that there is a scale, how to measure temperature, we all know. Uh, logistics is, again, this is uh, management of the flows of resources, it's quantitative, uh, qualitative, when there is no scale, when there is no units, and uh, when there is a situation, how do we organize uh, this? And uh, here I want to see you some tools, which I think it's most adequate, because I think uh, when you work on the quality uh means it's got to be a classification is uh, uh general and particulars and parts and uh, why do you have uh, nine uh, uh, for example nine competencies in my uh, my foreign colleagues why nine why not 11 why not three and uh, from here i uh, use tools uh, use tools that are binary matrices uh, which I do on classification uh, indicators. I'm not going to be stressing on that, but I just, uh, my international activities uh, uh, have problems when I try to explain and my colleagues, they don't understand it, but the tools uh, are really, the toolbox is quite simple and it's used uh, in, uh, not in those issues where we wanted to do so. Uh, since the limited uh, the digital economy, the digital economy, I was the co-author of uh, the article. Uh, so the digital economy that information innovation economy of knowledge creative economy etc so in this case uh, it's uh, uh, we try to do a definition which doesn't uh, double up but has certain aspects of uh, managerial and technological that characterize uh, this uh, direction and i'm going to be using this uh, so not so, so i'm so, so and not to offend any of the colleagues about 100 of uh, definitions were uh, analyzed and systematized and then management. Management is so. What is management? Even at the level of the company, is very difficult to. So, in the second level uh, of management or governance, the system, uh, the management system, the process is uh, the top down, and there is the bottom up. And when you have not from management, not the subject of um, management, but the supply chain management. So there is this author's definition of uh, concept of uh, management and. Uh, uh, the concept of uh, co company management. I want uh, my foreign colleagues uh, to also to participate and the author's definition is uh, doesn't mention the um, the internet except that the, so the discussion I have not managed to start because uh, I think the definitions are very uh, important for the understanding of what we have in front of us and we have to do something we have to deal with it somehow be competitive in this case. So in this case, 
uh, there would be a supply chain that uh, I gave the uh, uh, definitions here. Uh, so the supply chain is uh, quite a new science, and there was a first article in, in the 80s, uh, some specialists are still uh, working on the problems of what it is, and giving the definitions here. So what is the next uh, word after the actual notion? From the literature, I just uh, missed it a little bit. It shows that uh, this is a, a number of uh, terms of the system. Uh, this is the process operation, this is the relationships between the elements of the system and of course there is a flow, flow, the notion of flow that could be uh, referred to a certain so sources. So what we have here, the object of uh, ch supply chain management, um, there is definition of uh, uh, chain and flow and uh, why these words are at the basis there, I don't know, but they are the, the words in order to organize, to digitally manage and process uh, the supply chain management. You work not just uh, one object, but on four. Uh, so can I choose the code to manage so that the computer could easily uh, find this object and give the information dep depending on the code. Um, here I want you to, to draw attention that uh, digitization is to do with key, this is management part of course is and the technical part uh, which uh, we uh, deal with all the time. So it's a certain passing the button um, and uh, you have to tell the specialist and information technologist, the professional has to take them. So it's not the system that gives the uh, rights, but there is the customer that tells your IT department what he wants to get. And uh, so there is an attempt to pass the button uh, here um, to the developers of IT technologies. Um, to have the best uh, uh, for these technologies and uh, the development of recommendations. So there's this classic uh, matrix when there are two classifiers, uh, uh, the uh, condition and uh, the state. And there are these parts, uh, the object could be static and it could be dynamic and it could be uh, changing. Uh, so there are these two extreme. Uh, states. Uh, so the matrix has been seen in marketing and strategic management. You've seen it's quite a popular tool to understand that uh, the processes are quite complex and you can see uh, you can take it apart to understand. And here there is this uh, theoretical, methodological, uh, and of course oriented to uh, the value. Uh, client. So the value, value is something that we hear all the time and uh, it would be different form formulation, different terms. So what is value? And uh, this study takes it as the perceived by the client, value perceived by the client. So the client gets the product and then they perceive it and they get uh, an impression and that uh, affects uh, the further uh, value. So using binary, a uh, zero, one code, etc. You, you've seen it all in one of the studies that confirms that this is the code, this code is quite popular. And this looks like if it's complex, for example, four part project, and we can look at the project as a uh, object and not a, a part of the, there's just one, just one component, two components, three components, four components. So this from z is zero is uh, uh, no object, one is this one, and then there's a code that describes all four components and uh, and then uh, the flow system relationship process, all these words, they define the essence of uh, supply chain management in the key that is uh, given here in the literature. And the binary matrix, again, and there are two classification uh, indicators, horizontal, vertical, and uh, two states, uh, two states where that are diametrically opposite. So. There are four types of flows, four types most popular flow, uh, in literature could be found. It's not, and these are not just lines through the uh, dashes. This is just a matrix representation. Here you can see that any code, that material is zero, zero, and that's in the one, one, and another flow, and there's a computer. A computer has to understand what kind of flow it is. And the next situation, if we have material flow, and then it, it's products, commodities, and other elements that are used here. This is an attempt to have a matrix to have 
products to uh, transport uh, and handling load handling devices and uh, what uh, joins the flow what leaves the flow and uh, how it is processed in this situation here at the bottom here they would be common for example the material flow if there are three types of flow there will be one uh, triple zero because there are no th three flows but then there's blue uh, this is uh, uh, one 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 and a zero because there is a component probably missing for example in, uh, for example load handling devices are uh, and then from the flows to chain to the links so again there is a classification here classification of the links so the four elements of the links that we use in the first approximation and you have new codes uh, that continue the basic code that you've seen so i'm not going to be commenting here it's just the code is is longer longer is going to be uh, uh coded or decoded encoded uh, so the supply chain supply the we don't talk uh, a chain but the system uh, supply system and there would be more um, complex uh, here there is a certain classification of some systems um, it's a certain uh, a circulation system that blood transports blood to certain uh, body parts uh, so here the code is getting longer and longer and we're getting information not only on the process but the system also and there are certain variations that we don't know yet and they've not been defined but they could be also taken into account and there is also the relationship one off they could be and in this case uh, here we have uh, the long-term partnership uh, is uh, preferred so we have to build is that the company that we really know very well that we have the agreement with the contract with that can uh, that has a good rating uh, that uh, could uh, um, make it possible to build on this relationship and to maintain it and then the next element the fourth uh, the fourth component uh, when you have processes processes that are done on the elements of the flow so the links uh, that are in certain relationships and then there is this classification here of uh, the production activities of the company at the level one you can share it they can split it into elements um, and then uh, when the movement of the resources is split into the components and we have an uh, operation and then etc etc depending on what is of interest to us this is another option here and at the bottom here uh, there is a, a code which describes the object the flow and uh, uh, what link of the system is processed by the system what relationship is and what process uh, uh, what state the process is in what i wanted to do here is to try out uh, the uh, quantitative methods uh, the medical methods to measure what can be measured with uh, uh, to use the classification uh, uh, indicators and then to probably come to some agreement some accord with with the IT, what I want to get from them to get the competitive advantage. So, um, summarizing here, here I, this is to do with management. Uh, the company wins that has the team, the team where every soldier knows his maneuver uh, within the subdivision, subdivision within the uh, platoon, platoon, etc. And uh, so it will be uh, faster uh, completing the task and. Uh, this will be the mechanism as that gives more value to the consumer and to participants. So thank you very much. I can give, answer some questions. So Alexey Petrovich, thank you. Thank you for your keynote. Um, dear colleagues, uh, are there any questions? If there may be our foreign participants, uh, our people who are talking about chains or supply chains from abroad, uh, please, uh, yeah, Olga, yeah, a question. Uh, uh, how universal are your approaches for companies if they work in different uh, types of industries, uh, different uh, sectors? How universal are your approaches? Well, thank you very much. Uh, supply chains, of course, they are different. And of course, uh, is, uh, uh, for example, uh, the um, production of a car, for example, from the quarry or on the garage of the client. Uh, so it's like... Um, 
logisticians, they don't uh, talk about the technologies, they work um, on the uh, joints, on the connect uh, between the company so to get a computer together and to get uh, uh, on a conference then you uh, connect up with the pieces of wire the cables and you're on the, online uh, so yes uh, of course um, the uh, industry specific aspect could be studied but either because transportation uh, storage or log logistics it doesn't matter so the flow has to move from one link to another so this uh, chain has to work without uh, stoppages. When you compete for time, you can win only when you uh, shorten uh, the stoppages. So this is, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. And I have to ask another question that I asked already. Value is, uh, is, uh, is the very individual category. How can you compare? How can you measure it so this is what i'm doing because here you talk about the following say value value added value uh, a perceived value perceived value so there's five types of, uh, of value that can be delineated and they could be compared to one another uh, there are these uh, for example they overlap sometimes there is a combination here uh, for example in i can have my headache and then uh, i have two values now to continue my work to carry on with my functions for instance so there is uh, there is no uh, it is unique it is unique you see i, I don't see the opportunity here. it's got to be individual a supply chain for a rich client of a wealthy client and uh, traditionally we talk about the value is a uh, difference uh, uh, between the profit and the expense for the client is not important for the client what's important is uh, uh, to uh, uh, ensure the livelihood to provide for the livelihood so this is the the perceived value is uh, the thing thank you thank you colleagues any more questions or no more questions so alexey thank you very much Title Fabrication Laboratories, the development of new business models with new digital technologies. The aim of this study that I, I made with my colleagues in 2018 is to analyze where do it yourself come to life, investigating the economic reality of fab labs. These laboratories work with the typical mechanism of the sharing economy. They provide a, spa a space with tools and equipment for digital manufacturing, making them available for individual users, small businesses and schools. The aim of this study is to make a comparison between laboratories in different economic realities, in detail laboratories from Europe, uh, considering Italy as a main reference, and other European laboratories in that is uh, Spanish, uh, German, French, and uh, laboratories from the Netherlands, and also American ones. <clears throat> this study attempts to recover literary gaps since only few specific qualitative studies have been done until now about Fab Labs. The novelty resides in the quantitative um, analysis that has been developed on a large samples of uh, laboratories from different countries. And Italy has been taken as a reference economic reality and it has been deeply investigated and compared its situation with the other in Europe and America. Therefore, the research question that the paper wants to investigate are, first of all, how is the structure of the Fab Lab and which are the differences among Fab Lab in different uh, realities. The paper wants to investigate 
the main customers, the sector in which Fab Labs operate, digital technology they use most, what kind of services they deliver to customers and what kind of skills they have. And then, which are another research question focuses on difference and similarities uh, among Italian Fab Labs, the main European ones and also the American ones. As for the methodology used, data from European and American Fab Labs were collected using a questionnaire survey performed on a total sample of 493 Fab Labs. The use list and contacts on Fab Labs has been found in the official website of the Fab Foundation, that is an organization found in 2009 to facilitate and support the growth of the International Fab Lab Network. A double administration survey allowed to obtain 73 Fab Labs that participate in this survey, reaching a total response rate of 14%. Considering Fab Labs in Italy, the profile of Italian Fab Labs respondents depicts that volunteers workers are usual workers, and in 73% of cases, there are among 1 in 10 volunteers working on each Fab Lab, while more than Fab Lab in two does not have paid staff. Therefore, they work only with volunteers workers. As for the number of associated or registered users, while some Fab Lab, some of them do not have registered users, mainly I believe that they are um, Fab Lab that are born uh, established recently, uh, there are others which have more than 100 registered users. As for the annual income, in average in Italy, uh, uh, the income of, of a Fab Lab is uh, about uh, 30,000 euro, and their investments for machinery and technology are relatively low, with 51% of Fab Labs, that is one Fab Lab in two, that invests less than 10,000 euro per year. Analyzing the main customer, customers of Italian Fab Labs, the results show that individual customers are the main subjects these laboratories work with, followed by practitioners and designers, while universities seem to be the institution with which Fab Labs collab collaborate rarely. As for the major services delivered to customers, Italian Fab Lab offer a wide range of courses and training, playing an important role in design education. Moreover, they offer support in the creation of prototypes, in directly 3D printing of products, and in giving support to the design of new products. Therefore, these results show that Fab Labs are not only places of practical things for creating objects, but also places for sharing skills and competencies. Afterwards, the respondent Fab Labs were asked to indicate which were their main skills, and it has been found that the main skills of Italian laboratories are digital manufacturing, skills in using design softwares, and skills on materials. As for the skills they possess less, it seems that they have not so much knowledge on the Internet of Things and on issue on company products. This second result is in line with the fact that Italian Fab Labs work more with private customers than with businesses and practitioners. Considering Italy versus Europe and America, and therefore comparing the Italian reality of Fab Labs with the main European and American ones, the results show that French and German Fab Labs seem to be the ones with more volunteer workers, even if in general volunteer workers are present in all realities. Considering Fab Lab users, the USA, Germany and the Netherlands are the ones with more registered users, while Spain seems to have small Fab Labs with a low number of associated users. Also, in terms of turnovers and annual investment, the American Fab Labs are more important economic realities than European ones, with an annual average income of $154,000 and investments that in some cases go over $1 million, like multinational industries. 
Upon examining the type of consumers international fab labs have, it can be seen that except from Germany and Spain that seems to work with universities and those educational institutions, the other European and American realities seems to be in line with the Italian one and they have uh, private customers as the main customer. Investigating the sectors in which international fab labs operate, it can be seen that both in Europe and in America, laboratories work more with the technology industry, in detail, electronics, and also IoT. However, in Italy, also the furniture industry is an important industry with which Fab Labs work with. Considering the kind of digital tools used in Fab Labs, 3D printers and laser cutters are the two most used, both in Europe and America. Analyzing the services Fab Labs deliver to customers, courses and training are the most offered in all realities. Uh, if Fab Lab skills are taken into consideration, almost all Fab Labs have skills in using design software. And while Italy and European countries have more manufacturing skills and, and Arduino programming skills than the USA, uh, America, on the contrary, declares to have relevant hardware and also material skills. The results show that the function of Fab Labs in education is quite broad, reaching from basic science, technology, engineering, mathematics, education in general, and early encounters with design through use of the labs as ideation and prototyping space in denial design education. Therefore, Fab Labs could act as a link between customers and businesses for the development of personalized and innovative products, moving towards a new socio-economic model that is the collaborative economy. In many cases, the problems that Fab Labs focus on are in fact highly localized and address needs that governments or markets have overlooked. Once developed, however, however, they are often adaptable to markets and communities around the globe. By sharing information across the network, thinkers and users around the world can adapt this innovation to their own local circumstances. Thank you for your attention. Colleagues, are there any questions to this keynote? Uh, Laura, uh, uh, can you hear us, Laura? Yes, yes. If you have any question, I hear. Uh, so in your study, I didn't see Russia in your study. If uh, it is of interest for you, we are ready to offer cooperation and become part of your study. What, what do you uh, think When about I it? did the study, I, I thought to focus on Europe and America, but Russia is a good... <laughs> Uh, is in a, a reality that is it is important to focus on so uh, it is a good a good um, to how can i say uh, for future works i will also compare russia to europe and america to be more complete So we're very good, and we're ready to suggest cooperation from our side, our Institute of Economy from of the Russian Academy of Sciences. Let's stay in touch. Yes, of course, I will be glad to cooperate there with you. There is a question. There is a question. I am uh, as a director of the Technopark. Uh, in the recommendations of Fab Lab, one of the uh, main equipments are printers, are the plastic or gypsum printers. And as of today, the prototypes which are needed to produce for the industry, these prototypes, they require different type of equipment, uh, laser cutting and metal and mechanical uh, processing. From the point of view of your, of your study, how did you take into account these technological centers which are necessary for creating prototypes, not just in Europe, but across the world? Because from my point of view, the equipment of Fab Lab for proper prototyping is not sufficient, is not enough. Thank you. Um, I didn't understand well the question. Uh, why I didn't uh, try to consider also these technological centers? Is it right? Uh, 
Yes, yes, because uh, Fab Lab is limited in in terms of um, uh, production capac capacities. Yes, this is true. Uh, we, for methodological uh, methodological question, we focused on Fab Labs that were on the Fab Foundation site in order to have a. Um, a um, homogeneous sample, but I agree with you that Fab Labs always, in many cases, as the the, the study showed, uh, are small realities, and they have also um, <clears throat> less technological, uh, less machinery than more big technological centers. It would be great to develop a parallel study considering more bigger technological centers and to consider machinery, uh, 3D printers, laser cutters, uh, for also for other materials and not only plastic because Fab Labs mainly uh, work with plastic. And uh, consider uh, these realities for uh, a further study to develop and to consider how they work because merge together Fab Labs and these technological centers could show uh, differences. So maybe it could be interesting to develop um, um, a paper when, when, when you can compare Fab Labs and this technological center, but as two different units because they are different. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. So we invite you to cooperation. Uh, colleagues, um, if there are any questions. <clears throat> so then uh, this is it, colleagues. Um, our plenary session is over. I believe uh, the second part has been very interesting. And uh, we've had uh, keynote speakers. Uh, who were talking about economic processes and we had a special technical keynote so i think uh, it's been mutually enriching and i mean uh, it's including for our colleagues who are working with these technologies and we've heard uh, the materials from the economists and the technologies uh, which we're using there how these technologies are used in the real sector of economy i thank everyone colleagues And uh, what will follow our uh, section uh, keynotes, unfortunately, there will be no simultaneous interpretation. There will be uh, keynotes in Russian or in English. So but nevertheless, the keynotes will be interesting. <clears throat>